Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Rose in Science event. I'm Wang Hui from CELM, the Changchun Institute for Optics, Fine Mechanics, and Physics, Chinese Academy of Sciences. Thank you very much for taking part in the 2022 Rose in Science event on the International Women's Day. Rose in Science was initially launched by CELM in 2015 to mark the UN International Year Flight. So far, this celebration of female science workers has been successfully held for four times. In 2021, Rose in Science went from offline to online with the ICANX platform, the IEEE Photonic Society, the Optica, and the famous optics journal Light Science and Applications joining in as co-organizers, giving the event a much greater and wider international influence. With Rose in Science, we aim to shorten the physical distance between people and achieve heart-to-heart -heart communication. Women are working alongside men all over the world to promote scientific and technological progress. With Rose in Science, our goal is to help those young women who dream of having a career in scientific research find their own life coordinates and show them what is possible if they persevere. A philosopher once said, roses do not blossom hurriedly. Okay, you lost your voice. Wait, you lost your voice. Can you get my voice now? Uh, yes, okay, please. So beauty, like any masterpiece, takes time to blossom. But we all know that blossom they will, the lovely roses, in the green and the lush garden of science. Last year, our theme was Rose in Science, Lighting the World, reflecting the value of female researchers. The theme of this year's event is Blooming Rose in Science with which we hope to showcase the multi-dimensional talents of women. This year, we have invited female professionals from six continents, including Asia, Europe, Africa, North America, South America, and Oceania. They come from different countries, different age groups, and are working in different fields. However, they do have one thing in common. They are outstanding people, and today, they will talk about their work and life and share their insights with us. Today's event would, be would not be possible without the support we have received from various organizations and people. First, it would be my honor to invite Dr. Zhang Xuejun, the Vice President of CELM, to make a speech. Hello, everyone. My name is Zhang Xuejun, the Vice President of Changchun Institute of Optics, Fine Mechanics and Physics, Chinese Academy of Sciences. First of all, I'd like to thank you very much for your continuous support to our institute. This year, SciOnth is celebrating its 17th anniversary. As the Pioneer Institute, we have been committed to promoting the development of optics and optoelectronics and have made a series of major achievements, none of which will be possible without the hard work and sharp minds of our female and male colleagues' joint efforts. First launched in 2015, the Rose in Science event is the stage on which the spotlights shining on the world outstanding women working in science and technology. We are very honored and proud to have you all as our guests of 2022. With this event, we hope to provide guidance and directions for women scientists and researchers. I am sure that by working together, we can expect it more scientific discoveries and innovations in the near future. I sincerely wish 
all the roses outside can bloom beautifully in their own fields. Finally, I would like to invite all our guests and audience today to visit Siam after the pandemic, so we can establish cooperation and friendship. I hope this event very successful and happy Women's Day. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zhang. And now let's welcome the founder of ICANX Talks, Ibis Zhang from Beijing University to give a speech. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Alice Zhang from Peking University. Warmer greetings from Beijing. As a founder of ICANX Talks, I'm so happy to enjoy this special International Women's Day online with all of you. Our best friends from all of the world in science and technology to celebrating all this special event. And today, I want first to deliver my best wishes to you. Then. I have a, a special mission. I need to deliver a message from Professor John Marie Lien from University of Strasbourg, France, the Nobel laureates and chemistry. He sent a special greeting message to those in science event and a special day. So here I read all these messages on behalf of him. In this tragic day of February 24, 2022, when Russia start to invade Ukraine, I would like to address the community of Rose in Science event by making three wishes: to think in the spirit of science, to be heavier in the pursuit of peace, and to encourage women alongside men, lighting the world by making their dream of science and peace become a reality. These three wishes are our themes in roles in science. Thanks to Professor Lin, we know that women must take the lead in science and peace alongside with men, because science do not. Depends on the DNA and the chromosomes, but science, as well as producing and bring up kids, requires a climate of peace. Here, I want to deliver this message to our sisters and brothers worldwide, men and women. We not only produce kids; we also produce peace. And we produce science. We hope we can working together to become the best friends and to make all this dream come true. I think yes, we can. Yes, we can. Thanks, Alice. Some of our friends also have sent in their blessings. Let's take a look. <laughs> Uh, my name is Deepa Venkatesh. I'm from the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras.、Uh, it's a great pleasure to be a part of the Rose in Science、uh, event organized by the Changjun Institute and the Chinese Academy of Sciences. The organizers seem to have taken a lot of effort in bringing people of varied expertise from different parts of the world. I wish them a really grand success. Thank you. From Mauritius to the participants and guests of Rosen Science 2022. My name is Isabel de Mello. Very few will know me in the scientific world. In my own way, I am, however, a tiny part of your world. As an angel investor, I am keen to invest in innovation. Have been doing so for the last 12 years in Europe and now in Africa. I'm proud to say that many of the startups that I have helped fund, particularly in health and biotech, have women founders, and most of them started as researchers. Today, a number of women scientists who have chosen this route will be sharing their experience with you. They are brilliant and should inspire you to follow in their footsteps in finding the solutions to many of the problems we are seeking to solve. Be guided by your passion and dare the journey. Wishing you a very fruitful event. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I am Zhang Yi, a professor from Changchun Institute of Optics, Biomechanics and Physics, Chinese Academy of Sciences. CEO of Spirit AI, I am honored to be invited to this celebration. To my mind, science is all about discovering why, so spend some time answering why. Firstly, do not kill your curiosity, no matter age, 
gender, ethnic background, and other factors. Secondly, follow your passion and don't always stay in comfortable zones. Thirdly, never lose sight of the goals and never lose infinite hope. As the saying goes, if you enjoy the fragrance of a rose, you must accept the thorns which it bears. Happy Women's Day for everyone and may Rose in Science a great success. Thanks. Hello. I'm Mina Tokar from Turkey. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Metallurgical and Materials Engineering at uh, Eskişehir Osman Gazi University. And I'm very really happy to be working uh, in an interdisciplinary field where uh, more and more uh, women scientists are uh, participating uh, each and every day. And it's uh, great to have organizations like you, like the Rose in Science. Uh, event which uh, celebrates the achievements uh, of uh, women in science and uh, I wish you the uh, best uh, in your uh, events. Thank you. The world needs women influence and contribution and we are the generation to show that have joint and responsibility. Let's, Let's work together, together to break the bias. We are the Zulu chapter of P.I.E. I say I First, congratulations on the 30th Rose in Dance. On the of scientific research, women at the moving forward seven scientific the first of the world science and technology. On the those inside, we pursue their case. And can still feel beauty a lot in the complex world. We look forward to more women scientific and technological workers coming to the fall. We will all So thanks for all the good wishes from our friends. Today's event consists of two special sessions. For each one, we will have six presentations and a panel discussion. This is the schedule for the first session, in which the speakers will introduce the latest developments from the fields of mathematics, optics, academic journals and share their personal growth experiences. And this is the schedule for the second session in which we will get to know the latest progress and the future development in industry, display technology and the micro nano devices and the systems. The first session is going to be hosted by Ms. Lan Fu from the Australian National University. Currently, she is a full professor and head of the Department of the Electric Material Engineering at the Research School of Physics, ANU. Her main research interests include design, fabrication, and integration of optoelectric devices based on low-dimensional 3 5 compound semiconductor structures. She is the current chair of IEEE Nanotechnology Council Chapters and the Regional Activities Committee associate editor of IEEE Photonics Journal, and ICANN XTalks co-organizer, etc. Now let me give the floor to Ms. Fu, please. Thank you very much, Hui. Um, I am delighted to host this very special event to celebrate the International Women's Day. As a woman, I appreciate this particular day of the year that has been dedicated globally to acknowledge the contribution of women around the world, celebrating the social, economic, cultural, and political achievements of women. This special day of the year is also extremely important for us to raise awareness against the bias and also take action for equality. In our special event, Blooming Rose in Science today, we will celebrate achievements of a group of women who have made significant contributions to different scientific fields. Hear them sharing the journeys with a career in science and also thoughts and ideas on how to break the bias. So in this first session, we have six speakers. Our first speaker of this session will be Sandra Martinez, who is a professor in mathematics from the University of Buenos Aires. And firstly, we'll, hear, uh, we'll watch a little short video from her first. What comes to your mind when you think of Argentina? Football? Tango? or the sun-kissed beaches of Buenos Aires. At today's Rose in Science event, you're going to meet a mathematician from Argentina, Professor Sandra Martinez of the University of Buenos Aires. Founded in 1821, 
The University of Buenos Aires is the largest comprehensive university in Argentina. Sandra Martinez is a professor at the university's mathematical department. In her master's and doctoral stages, she has always devoted herself to the study of the theoretical properties of some classes of differential equations and free boundary problems. When she was doing her PhD, along with her mentor Naomi Walensky, she studied the existence and regularity of the solution and the free boundaries. Also, she visited and took different courses at important academic centers in Italy. Since 2010, she has been a professor at the mathematical department of the University of Buenos Aires. She is working with members of the Photonics Lab at the Argentine National Scientific and Technical Research Council, and she proposed the method SUPPOSE, which is short for supposition of virtual point sources. In addition to being busy with research and teaching, Professor Sandra is also a keen swimmer. She believes swimming can help to shed negative emotions and relieve stress, leaving the brain feeling relaxed and positive. Great. Let's just welcome Sandra to the floor, where she's going to talk about uh, suppose a deconvolution method for low-dimensionality images. Welcome, Sandra. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I maybe why I cannot see the first slide. Okay, sorry. Um, no, I don't know. Okay, sorry. So um, I will talk about suppose uh, the convolution method for low dimensional image, and this is a uh, joint work with uh, members of the Photonic Lab in Argentina. Um, I will start with uh, the index. Uh, first, um, I will talk about what is uh, the convolution problem, a typical deconvolution problem, which is a single molecular localization method compressing both uh, super lossal methods. And then I will go directly to my our uh, methods post. Uh, I will talk about the method, the bonds, the resolution criteria the noise, how it affects, and other versions of applications, and then some conclusions. So what is uh, the convolution problem? Well, in any measurement, you have uh, always uh, what is called the point spread function. And here we have the object and or the instrument respond function, in the, depending on if it's on an image or any other measurement. So we have the convolution with the point spread function. And always we have an additive noise. In this case, uh, the additive noise is a Poisson noise. And uh, then you, you have the retrieval, the image is, looks like this. And if you use a standard convolution, uh, uh, if, you, if you make a standard convolution, uh, this typical is a ill posed problem. That means that the retrieval can lead uh, to artifacts. So the, 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 if you want to go backwards, you could don't get the original object if you use uh, just the convolution. So there are many methods called convolution problems that adds a regularization term to avoid these artifacts. But what we obtain is a low resolution image and you don't get the, the real object. So the questions is are, uh, why can we improve the resolution when you use a standard convolution uh, method? The first thing is that, well, you still use the same PCF, you're not changing the point spread function. So you, the, the, I'm not going to talk about this point and I will concentrate on the second answer is that we are not using any information about the ground truth. Like uh, maybe, is it a single molecule, the ground truth, or is it sparse? Like in this picture, you have three uh, sources. Or the third question will be, well, if, if it's not SPARPA, if it's filiform, or if it has any representation that we are not taking into account um, for this type of images. Um, in the last year, there have uh, appeared a, a very important method called single molecular localization. And here, the assumption of the methods uh, are that the two emitters getting closer do not emit at the same time. 
There are many variations based on the choice of the floor offerer um, and how they are introduced to switch between an on and an off state. Uh, but the basic is, for example, look at this of the uh, picture on the left. If this floor offer, uh, you have only one floor offer, and the picture that you, you will see is this one. At the right, you have another structure called NPC, uh, nuclear porous complex, which consists of uh, thousands of proteins. And uh, the diameter here is around 100 nanometers. So what you will look is this picture of the right. Um, so um, the idea is uh, if you assume that only two emitters can be enclosed or do not emit at the same time, means in not in, inside the, the size of the PCF, uh, what the method consists is, well, you just uh, localize the center using a fitting PCF and the precision or the accuracy that we, you obtain depends on the, how noisy is the image. Um, the fluorescent photoactivate localization microscopy called PAM was initially demonstrated uh, using uh, fluorescent proteins can, that can be activated using UV illumination. Whereas uh, stochastic optical reconstruction microscopy called STORM and closely related methods use a synthetic photographer that can photo switch in the presence of a suitable buffer. So um, all these metals have uh, the same idea of, of, of single molecular localization. And if you want to, to obtain a super soil image in cases where the image is, uh, uh, in each stage is only one forever activated, the idea is, is this one. First, you take thousand frames and the important thing is that on only and on and only all, you know all these frames, only one emitter is activated inside the PCF. So uh, in this case, uh, I was using the example of the NPC again, and in all the frames, only one emitter is inside the PCF. After all this acute adjustition, you can localize um, for each of the frames the, uh, the molecule. And so at the end, you put all this information together and you get a super resolved image. This is the main idea of single molecular localization. And for this example, uh, they can obtain an improvement of a factor of 10. Um, another way or another assumption uh, appears in the compressed density methods. And here the assumption is that uh, the sparsity of the ground truth. Uh, in all, for all these authors, uh, the important thing to obtain the bones are uh, the assumption that uh, the image is sparse and the bones depend on how sparse is the image and how noisy is the image. Uh, in this uh, synthetic image, there are um, different uh, sparsity assumptions. In this case, you can see you have two uh, meters inside this, this PCF here. You have a Poisson, also you have adding a Poisson noise. And the using compressed sensing, you can recover uh, this image. But on the other hand, if you see uh, this image on the, on the right, the triplet is not enough sparse to be resolved, re recovered. You can see here you have three uh, in sources inside the PCF, and uh, the retrieval is only one or two uh, sources. So, what is uh, supposed? So the assumption is supposed is that uh, the ground truth can be represented as a superposition uh, of virtual point sources of equal intensities. Uh, what uh, means that is, for example, um, imagine you have uh, the real image, the object is these two parallel lines, and each one consisting of around 142 uh, sources. So the representation here of the, of the original object is a combination of these uh, the sources uh, and you have multiplying on, on each of these uh, summatory the, the real intensities. Each one has different intensities. Then the image that you see here is the convolution of this R with the PCF plus a noise. On the other hand, when you make this assumption, the representation of suppose is assumed that we can approximate this uh, object like a cloud of, of sources, and each of these sources has the same intensity. So 
in this case, the ground truth is uh, has around, in this case, M is the number of real sources and N is the number of virtual sources. The real sources are 142 and the virtual sources are around 1000. And so after that, that assumption, you make a convolution with the, the PCF. Uh, then I will talk a little bit about this PCF. And then you make the difference between the real image and the approximated image. Um, you minimize that and to find the minimum with what is called a genetic algorithm. Uh, here, the problem is that, well, it's not a problem, but you, you have uh, N is in general big. So if you use a standard uh, minimization optimization problem, uh, methods, you will arrive to a local minimum. So the idea is you start with an initial cloud of, of virtual sources, all, all of them, in this case, you have 1,000 sources. Then you make a, a devolution and you arrive uh, to the solution, I suppose. At the right, what we have is the representation as an image. You just convolve with a small PCF to, to observe the, the, the solution as, as an image. So the other thing was, well, theoretically, you have to obtain some bonds for the error. So if you measure the distance between the uh, between air, the, the real object, and the measure object, or, or the, the minimum that you achieve, uh, we see that the, the, this, uh, this error depends on, on, on the, the quotient between the number of real sources and the number of virtual sources times the truncation error plus n and times the PCF error and the signal to noise ratio. That means that if you have a noisy image, that means that if the, the signal to noise ratio is too small, you will need to put a lower number of, of, of virtual sources. The same with the PCF error. If you have a lot of error on the measurement of the PCF, you will need to put a lower number of, of sources. And on the other side, if the number of real sources is big, you will need to put more number of, of virtual sources. And in this example, we are plotting um, the accuracy versus the number of virtual sources for the case of the two lines. And, and you see that a, a, the number of, of real sources are 142 and the optimal N is uh, around 1,000. And, and when, when, you took, when you take 1,000 uh, number of virtual sources, we obtain an accuracy of 13 nanometers. Um, the other thing that we have to measure is the a resolution for uh, suppose. But first, we have to define what is resolution for the original image because we want to compare how, how, how is the improvement. So the criteria that we use is uh, just arbitrary. Well, we decided that the constant of, you have contrast of 60% is a good result image. So we use the same criteria for uh, our supposed resolution. Um, so you can see that separation of 60% of contrast is good for the two lines. And in this case, we have a 369 nanometer for the uh, typical measurement and a wide field microscope. So for low signal to noise radio, we um, obtain a resolution of 100 nanometers. And for higher signal to noise radio, we obtain a resolution of 80 nanometers. That means an improvement of around a factor of four. Um, another version that we have developed is called Pulse Edge. In this case, the image is not field form as in the other case. But what we use is, well, if you want to approximate something like this is star that is um, well, a symmetric star, but uh, the, the inside is all uh, plenty of molecules. So, but what, what we want to recover is only the edge of this image, not the total intent. So we have to develop a version of suppose for edges. And again, we have an initial uh, number of sources here, and then you get uh, the evolution using again a uh, genetic algorithm until we achieve uh, the, the edge with super resolution. Okay, here is the original image, and this is the final edge to pose image. So uh, we also apply uh, uh, this uh, method for different images from fluorescent, for example, in microtubules, for mitochondria doing tiles, for Argosim, uh, it's a synthetic sample designed to assess and monitor the performance of fluorescence imaging systems. Um, effectin, 
And also for STED images in the clients of nuclear power complex, we obtain after doing suppose uh, with a single shot this result. Also, we develop the version of 3D uh, suppose edge and to obtain with super resolution edges uh, or, or surfaces in 3D. Well, there are a lot of, there are many applications, not only fluorescence, uh, all problems with convolution with positive additive sources can use this type of, of assumption. For example, in Raman microscopy, mass spectroscopy, light spectroscopy, optical current tomography, um, X-ray diffraction, scanning electron microscopy. Uh, so the conclusions are, well, first, uh, suppose that's a restriction that works for low dimensionality images, uh, field form, for example, or all the classes of, of images that we have uh, seen very quickly here. Uh, the PCF is very important, must be measured. If you don't know an exact PCF, you, you will obtain errors, but it's not so critical. But you need to measure first PCF. The resolution depends on the noise, as in the wide field, depends on the noise. And the resolution improvement, we obtain a, a factor four and in one single shot. Important, uh, a consequence of this is that the algorithm does not compromise the temporal resolution of an experiment because the processing is done at the post acquisition stage. And also, well, we have new versions and, and applications. So now uh, I want to uh, talk about a project and all my achievements related with my career. My initial uh, studies are in differential equation, free boundary problems, um, starting from existence and regularity, um, numerical problems. But uh, the first time of my career was very theoretical. But five years ago, Oscar Martinez uh, bring me the problem of, well, how can we recover uh, the impulse problem of the convolution in the cases we have field from images and not as sparse, necessarily sparse, low dimension images. So we think about this, these things a little bit uh, and we arrive to this uh, method of suppose assuming the superposition of sparse sources. Um, um, I think um, that um, my growth, my career is important, the, the the interdisciplinary group that I well, well, I work for. And Michaela Toscani appears and, and she is an engineer and she has a, a background in, in biological samples and she applies supposed to uh, fluorescence images. And she has already uh, got her PhD in February. Guillermo Binati, uh, he developed a two photon microscope in the laboratory and he implement, uh, uh, we implement by each other in a joint work, uh, Edge Suppose, and he already got her uh, PhD on December. Axel Lacalmesure is a physicist and he is doing uh, his PhD on OCT and also he's studying the, how noise affects the super resolution. Alejandro Maceo uh, is student physics and he developed a uh, Suppose in a GPU to make the metal faster. And um, recently, Matias Charut joined the group, and he is a, a student of engineering, and he is developing uh, support for 3D fluorescence images. Well, Oscar Martinez is the director of the Photonic Lab, and well, he he if you want to know something more about the physics behind suppose, you can go to a can talk on July. And the laboratory recently joined the Biomedical Institute, and we are thinking to do a front end so that the method can be used by the entire community that needs to suffer result uh, different measurements in one single shot. Uh, we have already have contacted various biologic uh, groups and to find what details they want to see and how much they want to see. Uh, my initial training was pure theoretical but working with an interdisciplinary group uh, made me grow and see how mathematics uh, can be used concretely um, in different um, applications. So thank you very much for the attention. Thank you very much, Sandra, for a very, very nice introduction to this um, a new technique to enhance the, you know, achieve this super resolution images. So I'm, um, uh, now let's move to our next speaker um, of this session. Uh, our next speaker is um, Dr. Meng Jie Yu. 
who is a Giblin Assistant Professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Southern California. So let's first hear, uh, watch the short video introducing uh, Meng Jie. In fictions and films, scientists are often depicted as being obsessed with work and somewhat boring. Now we all know that stereotype is far from reality. A real life scientist, this girl likes travel, horseback riding, boating, camping, etc. She is bubbly and full of fun, just like any other young ladies of her age. At work, she is a hardworking scientist who is dedicated to optical science. Her name is Yu Mengjie. Professor Yu is Galiban Assistant Professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Southern California. She received her PhD degree in Electrical and Computer Engineering in 2018 from Cornell University and held research staff associate position in Applied Physics and Mathematics at Columbia University from 2015 to 2018. Before joining USC, she was a postdoctoral fellow in the John A. Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Harvard University. Her research group of nanoscale nonlinear and quantum photonics lab leads efforts in advancing the fundamental understanding of nonlinear sciences at nanoscale, as well as realize next generation optoelectronic circuits for optical communication, computing, sensing, ranging, and meteorology. She serves on the Early Career Editorial Advisory Board for APL Photonics, the Committee of Advanced Photonics Congress, and Optical Fiber Communication Conference. She is the 2020 Optica Ambassador, the Caltech 2019 Young Investigator Lecturer, and the Rising Star Women in Engineering in the Asian Deans Forum 2019. She served as chair of the OSA Integrated Photonics Technical Group from 2019 to 2021. She was a recipient of Maiman Award and Emma Wolf Award in 2016. Great. Let's welcome Meng Jie to the stage. And she will be talking about the world of integrated nonlinear photonics. Welcome, Meng Jie. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. Thanks, Ari. I'm very honored to be here. Thanks for making the beautiful videos. And also thank the organizers, uh, Changchun Institute of Optics, for inviting me here. Uh, so today I will uh, hopefully present part of the world of integrated nonlinear photonics. Um, so here at the bottom, I list several different uh, integrated photonics materials that I have worked with in the past that include silicon photonics and this will photonics. Uh, I will briefly uh, introduce each of them uh, in the like in talk. Uh, so I uh, just recently uh, started my assistant professor in USC in the electrical computer engineering and my I'm leading a research group uh, called integrated nonlinear quantum photonics group. So obviously we're trying to explore nanophotonic technologies to, for applications of, of nonlinear and quantum photonics. So as we are a lot of us already are familiar about optics and photonics, it's a really beautiful uh, technologies. So it has a lot of advantages as, uh, for example, information carriers, as really enables really low loss, long distance communication networks and has a really large information bandwidth. We can encode our data in various degree of freedoms, including like pass, polarization, time and frequency. And also photonics has very extreme precision. So we can use light to measure things. So it's very, very high uh, like precision and accuracy. And integrated photonics are probably the only approach that can scaling or enable large density of optical components on our single chip. So in the future, you probably will see how we can transfer or this large benchtop optical systems or even data centers onto our photonic chip that can really are uh, integrated in your uh, like a mobile phones or in your computers or a size as small as it can sit on your fingertips. And once this is being realized, it can open a wide range of applications in a lot of uh, in a lot of er like like areas. 
here is kind of one of my beautiful or one of my favorite pictures that can beautifully illustrate the power of integrated photonics. And we really are trying to emphasize what kind of the scale of the devices we're looking at by uh, by uh, we're saying about integrated photonics. So on the right here is a kind of a really beautiful work led by Stanford University. Uh, it's our, our nano nano fabricated silica chip uh, as a linear particle accelerators. And on the left here is a two mile long particle accelerators that located in a national lab in California. So it kind of really uh, illustrate the power of integrated photonics, I think. And our, the other area is nonlinear photonics. And this is gonna be the key technology in the future photonic chips because uh, nonlinear optics allows us to control light uh, with optical, electrical, or even mechanical signals while light matter interactions. So using nonlinear optics, we have four different ways to manipulate, to control, to route light on those tiny chips. So that's going to be a critical, impo critically important technology uh, in the future. So. Uh, it really originate from this, like uh, when the presence of the uh, the electric field will introduce uh, like a dipole, and the restoring force of the electrons is actually a nonlinear function of the displacement of the electron with respect to the nucleus. And then, if you look uh, just very generally, the outcome of nonlinear optics is quite simple. It leads to creation of new frequencies or new colors. Uh, for example, on the bottom picture here, this is our an out. This is output of uh, photonic crystal fibers. You can see it can beautifully generate this like a wide range of spectrum covering all the all the visible light, starting from a single colors. And there are many requirements for nonlinear optics to happen. Uh, uh, I think it's kind of always useful to go back to a little bit of the history of nonlinear optics. So the first discovery of uh, experimental discovery of nonlinear optics is a process called second harmonic generation. Uh, so it's dis discovered by Peter Franken, uh, published in PLL in 1961. You can see this is one year after the laser was invented. Uh, in this paper, uh, Peter launched like 100,000 volts per centimeter kind of electric field into a piece of glass uh, around 800 nanometers and generate or he observed a really faint second harmonic spot at 400 nanometer wavelengths. Or uh, there is actually a funny story behind this because this second harmonic spot is so faint and the editor of this journal uh, removed this most important results from this paper uh, because he think it's a mistake. Uh, so uh, is, is this this really faint second harmonic spot which never made into print launched a golden age of nonlinear optics. Uh, looking back, this is a very obvious test, but actually it's revolutionary at that moment, because at that moment, we all think, we, we, we just never think you can change the color or change the frequency of a photon. But nonlinear optics has come so far away uh, to nowadays that it's actually quietly embedded in our everyday life. Uh, I believe many of you know a green laser pointer or have used it in the past. So uh, this green laser pointer, which emits uh, 332 nanometer of, uh, wavelengths, which is a green light, uh, is actually powered by a second harmonic generation process, the same process I described before. So if you really open this laser pointer, it starts with a light that is invisible to human eyes and get converted or frequency doubled to green light, then uh, to the green color light, then collimated out. Uh, so uh, like the more kind of the quote I want to say here is the more we're trying to do with optics or the more uh, we have to think about nonlinearities, just like the laser, nonlinear optics uh, seems to be everywhere. Uh, and my work works at the interception of our integrated photonics and nonlinear photonics because it really allows, the combination of both really allows us to achieve uh, enhanced and controllable light matter interactions for really harnessing the full potential of light or photons. Uh, in the, really in the future, in the next decade, I think you will see the, the future of integrated nonlinear photonic circuits has to really large scale like system with significant reduction in size, weight, uh, power, and cost. And you probably will see massive integration of like nanophotonic, electronic, or even acoustic components or integrated on a single chip. And it has some reconfigurability or you can reprogram that to solve like different kinds of problems. 
And our my group will are uh, focused on uh, fabricating those or uh, explore those nonlinear photonic process for application in particular in our optical computing, metrology, uh, quantum technology, and sensing. Uh, here's kind of the material photonic material toolbox that we are using that includes like silicon photonics that has silicon and silicon nitride, which is really a well known for its chi three or third order nonlinearity. And very recently on the listen now bay, which is a great photonic material for both chi two and chi three nonlinearity. I will kind of briefly go over our, like our in the in the next few slides very briefly. So on the application side, we're focused on doing our optical frequency comb generation for metrology, uh, looking at photonic computing, and also building like electro optic or acoustic optic, acoustic optic components on chip. So first, I want to introduce the first application of optical frequency combs. So there is a spectrum with discrete and regularly spaced comb lines, and uh, Optical frequency comb was originally invented to count the cycles very precisely uh, from like optical atomic clock. So the existence of this technology is why our time and frequency are still the two quantities that human beings can measure with the highest precision. And there's a coherent link between optical and microwave domains. It means you can use these tools uh, to synthesize optical signal uh, from the microwave signal, or you can get really low noise microwave signal from the optical signal. Uh, so the technology of optical frequency comes won the Nobel Prize in 2005. And actually there has been a really uh, rapidly evolving field or uh, has uh, been applied for many, many applications from fundamental science to applied engineering. Uh, here just like kind of one examples that uh, in my group that we did demonstrate uh, first integrated medium infrared microcombs for sensing and spectroscopy in the medium infrared. You can see we can generate this really broadband or uh, medium infrared uh, frequency comb spectrums are uh, starting from a single frequency line at three micron. And we have also looked at what how can we do optical computing by exploring nonlinear optics in micro resonators in the tiny optical cavities that you can fabricate on chip. Uh, we have built, based on silicon nitride, uh, integrated curved oscillators to explore the quant uh, true quantumness of this parametric process. And if we are, have a network of these curved oscillators on chip, then we can actually build an integrated photonic icing machines that can solve NP-hard problems, like NP problems in the future. And here are some like very small prototypes that are developed in the lab that we have like two spatially multiplex OPOs on silicon nitride chip are uh, observed the in-phase and out-phase operations. Uh, so the very last uh, kind of technology, uh, I mean, this field is always driven by uh, materials and how can we uh, make the materials like lower loss or like with advanced performance. And uh, recently we have looked at this uh, listen now rate like materials. And this is a, a wonderful materials with a lot of good uh, nonlinear properties and linear properties. Uh, it is uh, the really key components enabling the future data centers or even quantum computing because it has uh, both chi two and chi three nonlinearity. Kind of just like very briefly go over what kind of devices we're looking at in the lab. Uh, we have built like optical frequency comps devices and Raman la and Raman lasers, and we have looked into generate really really broadband optical spectrum for future optical atomic clock and also frequency conversion to generate light uh, down to really short wavelengths and also uh, uh, in, into the UV and also longer wavelengths into the medium infrared is gonna be critical for the future sensing technology. And uh, we have also looked at various very novel and interesting devices uh, that really allows us to control how the light, how light is flow in the frequency domain. By, uh, by, by, my, uh, by sending a microwave signal. Basically, we're able to like shift the frequency of like photon to different frequency beings as we wish. Uh, and then there, we're heading towards like integrating more components on this new photonic platforms. And this is just one example of building an integrated like femtosecond power sources are uh, where we integrated multiple state-of-art engineered components are uh, on the same chip. Uh, here is the electro-optic integrated isolators and uh, 
Here is the microwave signal processing kind of scheme and are uh, founded by DARPA Lumos. Uh, here just uh, like the chip that we worked, uh, that we fabricated based on the systems has like more tens of components or on the, or on the single chip. And this is a zooming of that picture. I think I are, am I running over the time? <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, it's like quick, uh, a quick summary here. That is our oh, so yeah, still have a lot of time. Okay, quick summary here that what I talked about and this uh, this field I present is integrated nonlinear, like uh, integrated nonlinear photonics. We have different uh, material platforms that we can utilize, and of course, uh, like again I said, this field is always driven by like new materials. Uh, new fabrication skills. We're not limited to silicon photonics. We're always looking for other uh, more advanced material properties. Uh, and this uh, is also simultaneously driven by the applications and like sensing and metrology, computing and information processing. Uh, we're focused about how can we use optics to capture and process the information very, like, very efficiently uh, on a very scalable platforms. Uh, we aim to achieve a very low power consumption, low loss and controllable and highly efficient optical interactions for next generation nanophotonic system. Uh, I think I was also uh, asked to present a little bit how uh, my career evolves in optics. So I'm gonna very briefly touch on that. Uh, so I am the optic ambassador of 2020. So or uh, like being an ambassador really allows me to uh, uh, have more chances to working with younger generations and are uh, trying to listen to their challenges and their problems and trying to provide uh, help in their professional like development. So feel free to uh, email me if you have any questions about professional development or scientific questions in the future. So here, I just wanna give a really brief kind of overview, like how did I get into this field? <laughs> Why I picked integrated photonics? Uh, this is a field that I worked for nine years now and then since I graduated from, uh, uh, from, since I get my ba my bachelor degree, and actually everything starts like very uh, start with uh, like a paper. <laughs> like I studied during uh, my senior year in uh, in my in my in my undergrad. So I came across this uh, like nature papers, which shows uh, like the very first few demonstration of silicon photonics and how can we use these tiny, tiny optical cavities on chip, on silicon that we can modulate light really, really, really like efficiently. And this is, I think is the seed for me and actually is the driving force that I want to uh, continue study in this field because I just think it's so cool. And then my dream at that point is to apply to this specific group. Uh, and then I looked at it and uh, I mean, this is a really uh, like famous uh, female like scientist in nanophotonics, Professor Michal Lipson. Uh, she at the time is at Cornell University and that's the dream school I wanna apply for because I wanna work in this field and really like this paper. Uh, things are just that simple. <laughs> and then uh, it kind of really uh, came true. So I got my bachelor degree in Georgia University in China. And then I was successfully admitted to Cornell, uh, Cornell University Cornell University PhD program. So uh, I think I'm like much closer to my dream like by doing this. So I was very fortunate I was able, uh, like I was able to, uh, I was able to get, 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 get admitted. Uh, so here's kind of my education like history. So I spent uh, six years, uh, uh, six, six years in my PhD program at Cornell. Uh, at that time, our, my advisor is Professor Alex Gaida, but we work very closely with, my, uh, like with Michal Lipson. Uh, so it's kind of like a dream come true kind of scenario for me. And then, uh, as you can see, my PhD uh, six years, it, I spent three, actually, I, it actually evenly split between two schools because my advisor changed from, he moved from Cornell University to Columbia University. Columbia, uh, Columbia Uni University in 2015. So kind of spent three years in each universities. And then I moved uh, to become a postdoc uh, in Harvard University you know, since 2018. Actually, it's not present. It's, uh, I just ended my postdoc like last year. Uh, so I spent like three years in Cornell, which is a really rural place covered by a lot of snow and three years uh, in the great New York City. Uh, 
uh, at Columbia, which is a really giant city. It's a quite different kind of lifestyle for me. Uh, it's a quite big change at that time. Yeah, I, I do have a kind of, I would say difficult and challenging time because my advisor changes schools. So if you have any kind of similar experience where you're facing these choices, feel free to, uh, feel free to talk to me, yeah. Uh, and I are always worked with uh, like amazing colleagues and they're both of the PIs has huge groups. Uh, so on the left is my PhD group from Alex Skyta and on the right is like my major, like major collaborator, Michal Lipson, they're both at Columbia now. Uh, can see I work with like more than 50 like uh, amazing people in the field. And then uh, I moved to uh, Professor Marco Lonka's lab at Harvard, exploring the listen now technology as I, uh, like, as I mentioned before. Again, it's a really uh, big group. We have like the highest number, we have like 30 people, like, like 30 people in the lab, I think. Uh, yeah, a little bit about my uh, kind of professional volunteer kind of experience. Uh, I think it's important uh, to have a community that are like around you uh, when you are doing science. You cannot just be like isolated in the lab all the time. It's important to fi find peer support, important to find friends uh, like outside of your lab. So I have been involved in many different uh, kind of, it's within uh, like optic society, but in different formats, like have been like student chapters, members in Cornell and Columbia. And our, um, the first year of my postdoc, I become the chair of the Optical Integrated Photonics Technical Group, where I can organize our different events. We have like 3,000 members all around the world, was able to uh, uh, like organize webinars or host events at conferences and our network with different speakers or experts in the field. And then one year later, I become 2020 Optical Ambassador, which again, give a lot of exposure of my research work. As at the same time, I was able to meet like her amazing younger generation scientists all around the world. And I, I think I gave like talks at uh, seven different countries actually, uh, like, like during that year, but, but it's during COVID. So everything traveling is much more easier. Uh, like again, a lot of uh, scientific in, like involvement, um, uh, like awards and programs that have been involved uh, as following. I think they're all like a great, every single uh, involvement or achievement, I think uh, really boost my confidence uh, first and also really help me uh, feel like, feel satisfied, feel fulfilled because I not only are, we were not only working in science, but also we're trying to pass down like very valuable like messages uh, to the younger generation and get their feedback and report and to change the society. I think it's amazing. I think everybody should try to do effective networking to make yourself visible and to bring positive changes uh, in the optical society. And there you can you can do science at the same time, you can have a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, so uh, just like, of course, like I'm an optical investor. I wanna say this is an amazing society society or community uh, in optics and photonics. They're really a home to many, many researchers all around the world. I do find belongings uh, here. And I have been involved in a lot of programs uh, like Innovation School where I meet a lot of uh, people, uh, great people, so friends all around the world. Our Optic Ambassador Program, I do encourage you to take a look. Uh, we have like 10 ambassadors selected each year and we form like great communities. We all, always offer support to each other when trying to make uh, our community better. Uh, like this is some events that I are uh, organized uh, at different conferences uh, in the Integrated Photonic Technical Group. Or I just want to leave a last note here. I think it's really important to live a balanced life. You should work hard, you play hard, uh, have a really good mental state is really important. Uh, very last is this like amazing uh, female uh, like people in our group. We have like seven female, uh, uh, seven girls in our lab uh, till the last year I left and plus a female cat. Uh, we had a great fun in our lab. And I think, uh, I mean, the world is changing and it needs to continue to be changed. And I'm really optimistic about that. Uh, like, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mengjie, for a very nice talk about uh, your, your, your research in integrated and nonlinear photonics, and also for sharing so many um, you know, insights in being a young, early career researcher. 
for your doing work, not only in the lab, but as well as, you know, reach out and engage in the broader community. So that's great. We'll come back to that maybe in our discussion. Thank you, Mengjie. So our next speaker will be uh, Dr. Ishunu Balan from uh, the California Polytechnic State University. Ishuju is also uh, ambassador of Optica. So let's first watch a video from her first. Prepare these ingredients according to the picture. Add flour, mix well until a dough is formed. Make the dough into these twists. Brush the surface with one beaten egg yolk. Put them in the oven for about 45 minutes and voila, you have the classic Turkish cookie, Tatal Kurabiye. That recipe is from Dr. Insinsu Bailam, amateur pastry chef and 2019 ambassador of Optica. In the latter role, Dr. Bailam has been delivering lectures to international student groups as well as mentoring students from all around the world. Dr. Bailam currently works as a lecturer California Polytechnic State University's Materials Engineering Department. Her research interests include femtosecond lasers, near and mid infrared solid state lasers, applications of lasers, graphene and graphene based saturable absorber devices, ultra fast spectroscopy, and nonlinear optics. Dr. Bailam received her BS degree in physics from Dokent University, Ankara, Turkey, in 2010 and her MS and PhD degrees in Physics from Koch University, Istanbul in 2012 and 2017. During her MS and PhD studies, she focused on the development of ultra-fast near-infrared solid-state lasers and the use of graphene-based saturable absorbers for the generation of femtosecond pulses from solid-state lasers. In 2017, she joined the Koch University Surface Science and Technology Center as a researcher and worked on ultra-fast pump probe spectroscopy, fluorescence spectroscopy, and development of solid-state lasers. Dr. Bailan received the Newport Research Excellence Award at the SPIE Photonics Western Conference in 2013 and two outstanding oral presentation awards at the Optica Advanced Solid-State Lasers Conferences in 2015 and 2016. In 2018, she was nominated to participate in the 69th Lindau Nobel Laureate meeting. Oh, that Turkish cookie looks really delicious. <laughs> now let's welcome yeah. Shushu to the stage to talk about graphene-based devices for the generation of ultra-short short pulses. Thank you. Uh, come, come on, Shushu, you may start sharing. No. Thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction and nice video. I'm really happy to be here right now. Maybe I should say a good morning, good afternoon and good evening since it is a global event. Uh, I'm connecting right now from uh, California. So let me share my uh, slides. Okay, and I will use the tool to show you Okay, you can uh, see my slides, right? Okay, so yes, today yes. I'm going to talk about uh, the generation of ultra short pulses, specifically femtosecond pulses, by using graphene based devices. Uh, as mentioned in the introduction, I'm Shinsu Bailam. Currently, I work as a lecturer at uh, California Polytechnic State University. I'm also one of the Optica ambassadors, I'm 2019 ambassador. And I'm really happy to be here right now in Rosen Science event. Uh, let me uh, first give you a little bit information about me. So I'm from Turkey. So I was born in Ankara, Turkey, the capital city. And I also completed my BS degree there at Bilkent University. Then I moved to Istanbul here, which is a unique city which connects all the Asia continent and Europe. Uh, continent. You can actually take a ferry from Asia to Europe or Europe to Asia, and you can change continents in 20 minutes. Some people live in the Asian side and work in the European side, vice versa. So Koch University is located in the northernmost district of the European side. It is very close to the Black Sea. And I uh, completed my MS and PhD degrees in physics there. And I also worked as a postdoc at uh, Koch University Surface Science and Technology Center. 
So very recently, I moved uh, from Istanbul to US, this beautiful city called San Luis Obispo. So it is actually uh, a city in between Los Angeles and San Francisco. It is like about an hour and a half drive from Santa Barbara. It's a very nice beach town. And I heard that it is called as one of the happiest places in the US. And no wonder why, because we have a beautiful nature, lots of vineyards and the weather is nice. It's like Mediterranean climate. So I actually recently started work as a lecturer at Cal Poly. It has been almost three months right now, so I'm quite new. Uh, so this is a photo from Cal Poly's campus and I'm teaching materials characterization class to fourth year material engineering students. Here uh, you can see uh, some of my students in these photographs. Cal Poly's uh, motto is learn by doing. So here students are, uh, they are receiving a lot of hands-on experimentation, uh, experimental um, experiences. So here uh, we are using some characterization tools, SCMs uh, with the students. And I, as I mentioned, I'm also one of the Optica ambassadors. I was elected in 2019, and I would like to uh, give a brief background about my application. Actually, I was uh, underestimating myself all the time. I was going to apply in 2018, then I thought that, oh, they're not gonna select me anyway, so I'll just skip it. But the next year, uh, I don't know, I, I had the courage and I applied. And I, I was elected, <laughs> so good news. And since then, uh, I've been delivering lectures to international student groups. I've been visiting uh, student chapters all around the world, mentoring students. Of course, after the pandemic, uh, we continue to do that virtually. And as uh, Mengji also mentioned, it's a great opportunity if you are interested in science outreach, sharing your experiences with younger generation, you should definitely go for it and apply. You can check the website of Optica for the application. And as I as mentioned in the introduction uh, video, I, I, I'm also one of the participants of Linda Nobel Laureate's meet, Nobel Laureate meetings. I, went, I want to mention that it, it was one of the greatest experiences in my life. It was one of the greatest conferences. So what Linda Nobel uh, Laureate meetings uh, does uh, they invite around 500 uh, students, uh, BS, MS, PhD, or early career professionals from all around the world. You apply and they select you. And they also invite around 30 to 40 Nobel laureates. And you have one week in this beautiful uh, uh, city in Germany, Lindau. You have one week with the Nobel laureates. You go to dinners, breakfast, activities. You listen to their talks. It is like... It is like a fantastic experience. I strongly recommend you to go and check the Linda Nobel Laureate meetings. And I think it has been uh, like, they, they have been performing this event for almost 70 years now. Their aim, when they first started, it was just after the World War II. And the scientists, they decided that, okay, we had the war, we lost lots of connections. We were not able to do science. We can now build a better world together. So they decided to start a global event uh, called as Linda Nobel Laureate Meetings, which is very meaningful to me. And today I'm gonna talk about graphene-based devices uh, for the generation of ultra-short pulses. So this is the Koch University where I completed my master's and PhD uh, degrees and I worked as a postdoctoral researcher there. And I would like to mention at this point uh, this work was done at Koch University during my PhD and postdoc studies uh, with the help of these wonderful collaborators. Okay, so let's start with the outline. First, uh, I will talk about why graphene and voltage controlled graphene based devices. You know, graphene is a very popular material. Then I will move on uh, with our motivation for generating near infrared femtosecond pulses. And um, I guess we have a a uh, very uh, broad audience with different uh, backgrounds. So here I will stop and just uh, give you a brief introduction about characteristics of ultra short laser pulses and saturable absorbers so that you can easily follow the experimental slides uh, such as optical characterization of our device, femtosecond pulse generation results and 
uh, nonlinear and ultra fast characterization results of the device. So we uh, we are all familiar with graphene. It is a, a two dimensional material. Uh, it has a honeycomb -like structure. You have the carbon atoms here. It is very popular because it is a very thin two dimensional material. It has a relatively easy production scheme compared to other semiconductor materials. It has exceptional electronic properties, but we are going to focus on the optical properties today. OK, so here uh, you see the uh, energy band diagram of graphene, uh, where the Fermi level lies at the Dirac point. We have the valence band, we have the conduction band. Because of this linear energy band diagram, it, can, uh, it has a broadband absorption. When you shine light on graphene, it can absorb from it can you can excite carriers from here to here, here to here, here to here. So it has a broadband absorption property, which is in fact uh, approximately equal to pi times fine structure constant alpha, and it is almost equal to 2.3 percent in a single pass. Because of this uh, strong and broadband absorption, and don't forget that it is an atomic layer thick material, very thin material with a strong broadband absorption. You can see graphene even with your naked eye. Here you see a, a fabricated monolayer graphene on top of a quartz substrate. I hope you can see that. And this is just a photograph taken by an iPhone uh, camera. So <laughs> it is visible to naked eye. As you increase the layers, of course, uh, 2.3% becomes 4.6 and it becomes more visible. Here you can see a photograph of a bilayer graphene. So uh, talking about optical properties, it also has uh, exceptional nonlinear optical properties such as fast recovery time. So when you excite carriers from wells conduction band, they decay uh, very fast uh, at the order of picoseconds, which is important for a saturable absorber and we will see why in the upcoming slides. And it also has a saturable absorption property. Saturable absorption, we mean that uh, when you shine light on the graphene, if the intensity of the light is sufficiently high, you can saturate the absorption of graphene. So it becomes transparent after a certain limit so that it can act as a shutter inside the laser cavity. It can increase the, yeah, first you, have, you start with the graphene, you have a high amount of loss in your cavity, and if you are able to saturate it, it acts like a transparent material, let's say with a residual loss, and then you have a low loss inside the cavity. So you can turn on and off, you can play with the uh, loss level of your cavity by using graphene. And as I mentioned, it has a relatively easy production scheme. Actually, I was also even able to produce one of them when I was a third year, summer of third year undergraduate student. So you can use, uh, this is located in Bilkent University. You can use chemical vapor deposition technique. And uh, we have a much easier technique called scotch tape method. Maybe you are familiar with it. Uh, Konstantin Novoselov and Andrei Game, they won the Nobel Prize in physics in 2010 uh, because of this uh, technique. You simply use a scotch tape and graphite and you can use uh, you can produce graphene. In the chemical vapor deposition technique, you use this uh, gas as a carbon source. You have an oven here. You synthesize, actually you mean gr uh, you grow graphene on top of a copper foil. Then after a few very simple steps, uh, which does not require any complex or expensive production facilities, you can get your monolayer graphene. So because of this uh, fantastic properties, optical properties, relatively easy production and scheme, lots of people, uh, they have been using graphene as a saturable absorber to generate femtosecond pulses from their lasers. So here you see uh, like two ends. Uh, this is the shortest wavelength that people use. And this is the longest uh, wavelength. And maybe there are like new results. I'm not uh, sure this may not be updated because Literature is updating every day with the graphene. And the red ones are our contributions, uh, the uh, contributions that we made at Koch University. However, uh, there's a one big challenge uh, with graphene if you are working especially with low gain lasers. So you have graphene inside your cavity. 
and it brings 5% round trip optical loss to your cavity and you cannot control it because it is already an atomic thick layer material. You cannot cut it in half. So it is what it is. So uh, if you are working with low gain lasers, this loss will create a problem for you. So what people do to overcome this problem, uh, they can actually play with the Fermi level of graphene. Here you see a regular absorption scheme. You have your Fermi level here. You can excite any carrier from valence band, to conduction band. This is the absorption. But if you shift your Fermi level up here, for example, and if you send a photon with a certain photon energy, you cannot excite the carriers from here to here due to the Pauli blocking because these states are already occupied. So graphene acts as a transparent material for these photon energies. For this purpose, uh, people have been doing chemical doping, but the chemical doping is not a reversible technique. You dope graphene and it stays like that. Um, also, people do electrostatic doping, uh, which is reversible. You can change the doping level. Here, people are using solid state capacitors. Uh, in this case, uh, solid state capacitors require high operating voltages and they have a limited wavelength range because it uh, requires high voltages to shift the Fermi level to up to visible wavelengths, for example. And we also have supercapacitors under the electrostatic doping, and we will see that they have a broader wavelength range and they don't require uh, high operating voltages. So what is a supercapacitor in basic uh, sentences? If you have an electrolyte between sandwich between uh, two uh, um, sandwich between uh, your electrodes, two electrodes, this is a supercapacitor. So we have a high dielectric constant electrolyte here. Let's assume they are graphene electrodes. We apply a voltage. We polarize this electrolyte, and this polarization results in the generation of very thin electrical double layers. So this will act as a one capacitor, this will act as a one capacitor, and they are nanometer thick. And since they are nanometer thick, you know the classical uh, like physics equation, uh, you apply a voltage and you have a distance between your capacitors. So you increase the voltage or you decrease the length. Here you decrease the length and you can apply few volts and generate high electric fields so that you can shift Fermi level uh, to vary the absorption in the visible or in the near infrared. And of course, it's a reversible process. So which makes super graphene based supercapacitors superior to solid state ones. And our structure, as you can see here, it's a very simple structure. So we have a gold electrode with a notch because we want light to pass through it. We have our electrolyte sandwich between the gold and our graphene, monolayer graphene electrode. So it has a long name. We put this name, Voltage Controlled Graphene Gold Saturable Absorber. In short, we call it VCG Gold Assay. From now on, I will try to call it VCG Gold Assay. So this was our graphene device. Now at this point, uh, after completing the introduction uh, about graphene and showing our graphene device to you, Let's talk about our motivation for the femtosecond pulse generation. In the previous talk, you hear a lot of uh, information about nonlinear optics. So to achieve uh, nonlinear effects, you need high energy, high peak power uh, lasers. So to achieve this, you need femtosecond lasers, actually, ultra short pulses. So uh, maybe the audience, you are uh, familiar with that. Femtosecond lasers, they have plenty of applications they can use and they can be used in archaeology, medicine, you know, the surgeries, tissue weldings, I don't know, industry, micro machining, lots of applications. So let's focus uh, one of the biomedical applications here, imaging applications. So I'm going to show you two different lasers, titanium sapphire and chromium forstrite with this near infrared operation wavelengths. Titanium sapphire is a very well-known laser system. It has been used in many different applications. Here you see a photo of a multi-photon uh, microscopy process. So if you have a femtosecond pulses, you can have multi-photon effects. 
So it can be used in multi-photon microscope and it, and it has been used actually as a commercial source. Uh, if we think about chromium forstrite lasers, uh, they are like less known compared to Thai Sapphire, but their operation wavelength is very unique. If you look at this chart, you will see that its operation wavelength is around here, where you can avoid rail scattering. So 800 nanometer is shorter than 1.2 microns. You have more rail scattering around 800 nanometer, and you have less rail scattering here. And at the same time, you can avoid water absorption lines. So this laser, because of this properties, characteristics has been used in uh, like deep tissue imaging applications, optical coherence tomography applications. So as a result, it is important to build such lasers with uh, good uh, femtosecond pulse generation characteristics. And so we came up with this novel uh, graphene-based design uh, and we try to understand how these lasers uh, uh, work and when they produce femtosecond pulses by using uh, VCG gold assay, R architecture. Okay, so at this point, I'm gonna uh, stop here a little bit and give you a uh, background information about femtosecond pulses, very basic information. So here you see a very, basic, the simplest laser cavity. You have two mirrors and you have a one gain medium. I'm not uh, gonna talk about the details, how we generate uh, laser uh, radiation here, but uh, there's a certain, this certain distance between these two mirrors. We call it the cavity length, the L. And this cavity length determines the, if you generate pulses, uh, reputation rates of your pulses, as you can see in this equation, this is the reputation rate. And here you see an actual data of a femtosecond laser. So the, its reputation rate, for example, 5.8 megahertz. From this reputation rate, you can uh, determine the energy per pulse, how much energy you have per pulse. And you can also determine peak power per pulse if you know the uh, pulse width. You know the pulse energy, if you know the pulse width, you can determine the uh, energy per pulse. If you, uh, in this laser cavity, waves are simply oscillating out of phase and you have continuous wave laser operation as if in a laser pointer. If you somehow manage to uh, lock the phases of this oscillating waves, you can get femtosecond pulses. Uh, I mean, for example, in continuous wave, you have continuous output over time. In a pulsed laser, you squeeze all this power, all this energy under this very short pulses. So you have a very high peak power compared to a continuous wave laser, and you can achieve nonlinear effects. There's a certain type of ultra short pulses. We call them solitary optical pulses. Uh, in this regime, uh, solitons, uh, we can describe them as pulses uh, with a certain balance of nonlinear effects and dispersion inside the cavity. And they are important because they can preserve their uh, spectral and temporal shape as they propagate. So uh, to have a solitary optical pulse, let's say you need to balance the dispersion and nonlinearities in, inside your cavity. And luckily they obey this uh, soliton area theorem. If you know your cavity energy, if you are know uh, the nonlinearities inside the medium and you have an expected pulse duration in your mind, you know how much dispersion you should add to get a solitary optical pulse. And to characterize solitary optical pulses, we have this equation. So in uh, time domain, we have the pulse, and in the space domain, we have the corresponding spectrum. And the multiplication of this, the full with half maximum of these two parameters is uh, equals to 0 0.315 if your uh, shape is such square. And this is uh, the shape for the solitary optical pulse. So you measure them and you multiply them and you understand, oh, I produce solitary pulses or, okay, they are like nearly solitary optical pulses. Okay. Now let's talk about a little bit uh, the characteristics of uh, saturable absorbers. Okay, uh, we have graphene uh, band structure here again. As I mentioned before, uh, the saturable absorber is a kind of absorber you can change the modulation depth. 
So at low fluences, low intensities, you have high loss inside your cavity. At high fluences, you have low loss. So you can modulate the loss inside your cavity. And at the same time, think about it like that. I send the laser pulse. I excite the carriers from balance to conduction band. So it is kind of transparent right now, low loss, but they should come back very fast, faster than the cavity round trip time, which was at the order of uh, nanoseconds in the previous slide, you saw it, so that it can act as a fast uh, switch, like it opens and closes, opens and closes, it modulates the loss inside the cavity, and you can get a femtosecond pulses like that. That's okay. Yeah, you have higher intense, then you get a femtosecond pulse. So I will show you a very short video. Here's a femtosecond laser in action. You see they are pulses. This is the output power. No pulse, we have less output power because let's go back to the previous slide. Continuous wave means that we have lower power. Femtosecond means that we have higher peak power. So in this regime, it works with a low loss. The laser works with a low loss. You, you have higher output power. In this regime, you have, uh, when you lose femtosecond pulse operation, you have a high loss and low output power. And laser prefers to work in the low loss, low, low loss regime, actually. Let's watch it again. Yeah, pulses. Okay. Okay. So now uh, we finished the theoretical background. We can continue with our experimental results. First, I will start with the optical characterization of the VCG gold assay. So this is a steady state transmission spectrum of the VCG gold assay uh, at different applied voltages. You see, as you increase the applied voltage, for example, around one volt, you are able to uh, modulate the transmission around like 800 nanometer. And if you go beyond, you can modulate the transmission to uh, shorter wavelengths because they have higher energy. So step by step, actually, you block the absorption due to the Pauli blocking. So this graph is like a recipe here. So two EF, let's say you have a one EV laser, like around uh, 1.2 micron, like from enforced right laser. So around 0.81 volt, you will block all the uh, uh, all the excitation, all the absorption process, and you are going to let the transparent graphene, and we are going to see the results. So this is the experimental setup for 1.2 micron laser. I'm not going to go into the details. Uh, you can have a simple laser cavity. You can have a longer laser cavity. It depends on your uh, application. Here we needed higher pulses, higher pulse energy, so to reduce the reputation rate by increasing the cavity length. We added this multi-pass cavity structure. It is a very fun structure. That's why I put the photos, the laser beam bounces back and forth many times. And to control the dispersion, we added a bunch of optics to our cavity. Similarly, this is the 800 nanometer Thai Sapphire uh, laser setup. Here you see we didn't need uh, like this uh, exotic things. So we work with a simple uh, laser cavity. We added a prism pair to um, arrange the dispersion inside the cavity because we are aiming to produce femtosecond pulses, solitary pulses. And let's take a look at the continuous wave operation first. This is our uh, recipe chart here. So this is the result for force right laser and this is the result for Thai Sapphire laser. What happens here is that you have the VCG gold assay inside your cavity there are no pulses or anything. They work in the continuous wave regime. Without changing the input power, you can increase the output power of the laser by increasing the voltage. Because one by one, you step, uh, you close the nearby wavelengths, you block them due to power blocking, and it becomes transparent. And as you see here, around 0 0.8 volt, uh, this output power makes a jump because after 0 0.8, it becomes completely transparent for this photon energy and similarly here around 1.5 volts because it corresponds to the 0 0.7 here to EF. Yeah, this squares also explain this, okay. 
Okay, so let's take a look at the femtosecond pulse generation results. So uh, in order to lock the phases of the waves oscillating inside the cavity, actually you give a small perturbation. You like um, translate the output coupler mirror a little bit and they start to generate femtosecond pulses. You uh, saw the equations which describe the femtosecond pulses. Here our data clearly shows that we were able to generate solitary optical pulses at the highest operation voltage of 0 0.8 volts because this is the product which is uh, very close to set square profile uh, product. And we were able to generate uh, sub 100 femtosecond pulses. And here you see the corresponding peak powers and photon energies. This is the spectrum. And this is the RF spectrum, uh, which shows that our pulses were well above the noise level. So we have a pure femtosecond pulse operation. Similarly, at 1.2 volt, this was the highest uh, applied voltage, which were uh, able to generate, uh, which was able to generate femtosecond pulses uh, from the Thai Sapphire laser. Similarly, we were able to generate solitary pulses. Okay, so uh, why we didn't go beyond the 0 0.8 volt here or 1.2 volts here, I, as I explained before, after this limit, it becomes completely transparent. So no absorption means that no saturable absorption and no femtosecond pulse generation. You, you are left with your quartz substrate and electrolyte. And this is the limit for force stride and this is the limit uh, for um, Thai Sapphire. Uh, how, how many minutes I have? Okay, a couple of minutes. Well, you more. can have three to five minutes, please. Yeah. Okay. Then um, I would like to add one more thing here. Uh, so uh, we were able to generate femtosecond pulses with the system up to 0 0.8 volts. And we were able to play with the output power of the laser without changing anything inside the laser. And in the case of Thai Sapphire, the limit was around 1.2 volts. So we demonstrated this by using two lasers. So how about the operation range, full operation range of this device? Because we don't only have two kinds of lasers in the world, we have different lasers. And we know that if we shift the Fermi level, we also affect the nonlinear absorption and ultrafast properties. So we performed an ultrafast pump probe experiment uh, with the VCG Gold assay. You can see the experimental setup here. We have two parametric optical oscillators, uh, optical parametric oscillators. One of them, this was pump, this was probe. They were both femtoseconds. And we had a femtosecond to nanosecond pump probe set up here. This is actually an in-action measurement. You can see the voltage supply here. We were applying voltage. And what we looked at, uh, the non we, are, we were looking at the nonlinear absor absorbance, absorption properties of this material. And we were measuring the pump and unpumped absorbance of the graphene. Pump and unpumped mean then, means that you send pump and then with a certain amount of delay, you see the send the probe and then you block the pump. So you don't excite the sample and you see the probe and you measure the difference. This is like a, taking a snapshot. So you have your carriers here excited as they go like step by step, step by step, you take the photograph of your carrier with the probe in. You can think of it like that. And if your delta is spectrum, depending on the sign, if it is negative, it will tell you that saturable absorption is happening. If it is positive, it means, uh, it means that you have multiple absorption, which is not favorable for femtosecond pulse generation. So let's take a look at this data. For example, let's take a look at 750 nanometers. So as expected, because of the photon energy of this wavelength, up after like 1.4 volts or something like that, it starts to behave as a like multi-photon absorption. You, you no longer have saturable absorption. If you look at the infrared, let's take a look at this yellow 1.1 micron. Yeah, after one volt, as expected, you go to the multi-photon range. And it is also important to investigate the carrier lifetime because we want it to be fast all the time while we are changing the voltage. So we also measured the lifetime of the carriers after the excitation. And uh, 
let's take a look at two wavelengths, two probe wavelengths. So as you increase the voltage, so after that it becomes multiphoton. We are not interested in it. So as you increase the voltage, you see that the decay time um, is around few picoseconds. So it's a still fast saturable absorber. And similarly uh, for the visible wavelength, selected visible wavelength. And we did all the uh, like measurements for all, for all wavelengths that I showed you before. So they act similarly. Okay, and uh, with the help of this pump probe experiments, we were able to come up with a map for this device, like a user manual. So here you see from this 3D graphs, this is for uh, visible wavelengths at 1.4 volts, for example. Up to 750 nanometers, it stays in the negative range. And this is the time, by the way, this is two picoseconds, and it is a fast saturable absorber. Beyond that, uh, the sign is positive. I, I forgot to put the legend, sorry. Uh, blue means that negative, and the, if it, it becomes red, it means positive. So here it shows multi-photon absorption. And as an example, in the near infrared, after 100, uh, after 11, 1.1 1 .1 micron, it becomes positive for one volts of applied voltage. Before that, it has still fast recovery time and negative, so it behaves as a saturable absorber. So we come up with this uh, uh, chart here, which shows you that the lower cutoff wavelength for this device is 630 nanometers. Below that, if you apply two volts, three volts, it doesn't matter, you cannot change the absorption. And there is a limit for this dielectric. You shouldn't go beyond three, four volts. And the upper cutoff wavelength for this device was around 1.5 micron because as you as soon as you apply 0.1 volt, let's say it blocks all the transitions. So there is no like there is no, no meaningful reason to use it in uh, higher wavelength lasers. For example, if you wanna do use it in 750 nanometer laser, this is your voltage limit. You can get femtosecond pulse generation up to this voltage limit with variable output power. In conclusion, uh, with these uh, works, we were able to uh, show the reversible and dynamic control of the insertion losses from visible to near infrared wavelengths at low bias voltages by using this unique uh, VCG gold assay architecture. And actually, uh, they were the first demonstration of first like optical uh, femtosecond pulse generation demonstration of such a voltage controlled graphene based device in the literature. And we were able to uh, investigate that the saturable and multi photon absorption behaviors depending on the applied biases. And we uh, came up with a map for this device. And we can say that this VCG gold assay architecture has the potential to be used as a versatile saturable absorbers in lasers over a broad wavelength range. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Inshunu, uh, for, for a very nice presentation. Now let's move to our next speaker, um, Professor Shuling Li, who is a great colleague and friend of mine, also working in the field of 3-5 semiconductors. So we're first watching the video from Shuling first. Yeah. Busy with the hustle and bustle of everyday life, we seem to lose touch with our inner being. Yoga allows us to achieve peace of mind, free movement of the body. With each stretch, we refresh our understanding of our bodies. Through inhaling and exhaling, we embrace nature and sense the synergy of our body and mind. Today, we're going to meet a yoga master who is also an outstanding scientist. She is Professor Xiu Ling Li from University of Texas. Professor Li holds the Temple Foundation Endowed Professorship No. 3 in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. She received her bachelor degree from Peking University and PhD from the University of California at Los Angeles. Before joining UT last August, Professor Lee was the Donald Bigger Willard Professor in Engineering in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. 
She also served as the interim director of the Nikolinyak Junior Micro and Nanotechnology Laboratory. She has published more than 160 journal papers and delivered over 120 invited lectures worldwide. She also holds 20 plus patents, one of which has already been licensed by a major global microelectronics company. She is a fellow of the IEEE, the American Physics Society, Optica, the National Academy of Inventors, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Well, that's certainly very impressive uh, yoga poses, and I look forward to do some yoga practice with you in the future, if opportunity. Yeah, that. <laughs> yes. So now let's welcome Shirling to the stage to talk about semiconductor nanotech and the balancing act. There is plenty of room all around. Shirling, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Len, um, and thank you. Hai Xia and Hui for, for organizing this event. I'm always embarrassed to see video or anything in, with myself in that. All right, so here's the, the title in the spirit of this very high level broad um, the le lecture with a broad audience. Uh, um, so my research is actually on semiconductor materials and devices. Um, whether it's research or it's life, it is a balancing act. Um, I, I want to convey um, there is plenty of room in all directions. Um, I am currently at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, I moved to UT from University of Illinois about six months ago. Um, so the work I'm talking, I'm gonna share with you is all from University of Illinois. Um, Here's a statement I, I really liked. I, I think it, it is true. This is pro, uh, from uh, Professor Jerry Woodall. Um, if you, you're living on planet Earth, you must know they're all electronics-based industry use silicon MOSFET technology. So my focus is actually on compound semiconductors, but I'm gonna start with the elemental semiconductor. This is the 19, 56 Nobel Prize in Physics, it went to these three giants, um, William Shockley, John Bardeen, and Walter Britton, for their research on semiconductors and their discovery of the transistor effect. This image right here is a transistor. It's actually made of germanium, not silicon, but germanium didn't last for very long and soon the entire field uh, went to silicon. And this, the discovery was actually made in 1947 at Bell Labs. And th this transistor was literally put together by hand. And that was 1947. And the next Nobel Prize, 2000, that went to integrated circuits, along with another group. I'm gonna mention that, that later. And that went to Jack Kilby. Jack Kilby conceived the integrated circuit idea, the concept in July of 1958. And his patent was granted in 1964. He was at Texas Instrument at the time. Um, he actually got his bachelor degree from University of Illinois. And, this is a quote directly from his patent. What is the integrated circuit? So this is a novel and a miniaturized electronic circuit fabricated from a body of semiconductor material containing a diffused pin junction. Note, this is a diffused, not implanted, not monolithically grown pin junction. So at that time, the patent covered a diffused pin junction. Uh, wherein all components of the electronic circuit are completely integrated into the body of semiconductor material. And so with this concept, what he said, which is true in many, not only in integrated circuit that's based on silicon in many other things. So there's no limit upon the complexity or configuration of circuits which can be made in this manner. That manner is integration. Another giant here, um, Robert Noyce. Almost at the same time, 
um, came up with the idea of integer circuit instead of a hand put uh, stitched together transistor. This integer circuit idea and was uh, filed a patent. He filed a patent. Uh, uh, he was at Fairchild Semiconductor, which was the precursor of Intel. Um, his patent actually was granted before Jack Kilby's grant, uh, the patent. So in his patent, he said, it would be desirable to make multiple devices on a single piece of silicon. That's what integration is. You make multiple of them on a single piece of silicon in order to be able to make inter interconnections between devices as part of the manufacturing process. And the goal is to reduce the weight, reduce the size, as well as cost per active element. In his patent, the drawing actually do not contain flying wires like you would do with by, by, by hand. He already had this lithography idea to put everything together using a parallel process. So that was the uh, contribution of a Jack, one of the contributions of Robert Noyce. Um, so today, the transistor continue to get smaller and smaller, put more transistors on a fixed area in order to, to increase the speed. Um, that's Moore's law in this strive to keep Moore's law alive. And every time some people declare it's dead and the, the conclusion year after year is always the death was premature. Um, but along the same, about the same time in the late 50s, uh, Richard Feynman gave this lecture, uh, December 29th, 1959. He gave a lecture which was to the American Physical Society. And this quote, this is plenty, there's plenty of room at the bottom. This is the quote that a lot of people agree is what started the nanotechnology. Of course, to different people, nanotechnology has a different um, definition. Um, but in this lecture, Feynman asked the question, can you make a circuit with atom, a few atoms? That is, uh, how, how, how far can we go? How small can we make things? So that, that is uh, the same spirit as, uh, um, as the uh, Moore's law. Um, so Jack Kilby, the inventor of integrated circuit, did not get the Nobel Prize until 2000. And by that time, Robert Noyce already passed away, so he didn't share um, the um, integrated circuit Nobel Prize. But this prize was shared by two other people, Al Farrell and Cromer, and that was not on silicon. This was for developing semiconductor header junctions using high speed and optoelectronics. Uh, when you talk about header junctions, you need more than just a single element. Uh, you need compound semiconductors. So these two uh, developed this mostly three, five header junctions uh, to enable lasers, LEDs. And so here's a, a modified statement. So there's plenty of room by beyond silicon. And there you go, 2014, the Nobel Prize went to LED and LED, the, this is actually the blue LED and that was based on gallium nitride, a 3,5 compound semiconductor. 3 nitride is a special 3,5 compound semiconductor um, for the invention of efficient blue light imaging dials, which has enabled a bright and energy saving white light source. So blue enabled white, that was the compound semiconductor history of uh, the, uh, the Nobel the Prize related to, to semiconductors. Uh, uh, my research group, uh, we work on nanostructure semiconductor materials and devices. I'm showing so, some of the devices uh, uh, we made using our uh, approach. And I'm gonna come to this if we have time, but um, I want to share something at a, at a very high level. Then let, let me know how, how many uh, uh, minutes uh, I have to stop me when, when it's time. Um, our goal is to make things small, to address the ever present need to reduce the size, weight, power, and the cost. And that has an acronym SWAP C. And our approach makes them small and in a compatible and 
scalable fashion, compatible with existing technology and scalable. Um, so you can actually take it to some practical application. But our research is always inspired by practical application, but we also emphasize the fundamental new science discovery. So that, that's the, the approach. Um, so I'm gonna share two, maybe three approaches that uh, depends on the time uh, that was developed in my group. Uh, this is an etching technique. That means I'm gonna remove materials and make nanostructures. Uh, if I take a, a piece of silicon, I pattern um, any, any pattern of uh, metal film, then I put this piece of silicon with the metal film into a solution and I could literally engrave that metal pattern into the semiconductor. Whatever's left behind is the structure that's the semiconductor I started with. So that in this case is silicon. So we pattern noble metal and put in HF peroxide and the etching takes place uh, only where you had the metal. So directly underneath the, the metal. In contrast, if I want to make such a structure, I can use dry etch, which requires a vacuum, requires a plasma with electrical field to accelerate the ions in the direction you want to accelerate, want to etch. And so that's the wet etch and this type of etching takes place in solution. And another way to make this is grow it from the bottom up. And one of the ways to grow this is using the catalyst to do this in the vapor liquid solid growth mode. And the etching method I introduced with metal on top, the metal actually serves as a catalyst. This is wet etching, and, but it's not etching in all directions. The directions defined by the metal catalyst and that's the anisotropy over there. It is called metal assisted chemical etching. Uh, we call it, we call it MAC etch for abbreviation. In the literature, you also see some people call it the maze without spelling, spell out the, uh, the entire etch, the four letter there. I prefer MAC etch because that's in contrast to wet and dry etch when you talk about semiconductor etching. And the throughput is quite high. As long as you can pattern it, we can etch it. So if we haven't done 12 inch. We are universally, so we work on small pieces, but it, it, it should be um, scalable. So that's a very brief introduction of that method. Uh, um, these are some of the structures we made. Here's a silicon nanowire array with the aspect ratio of 100 to 1. That was made in 20 minutes. If you double that to 40 minutes, uh, the aspect ratio becomes 200 to 1. And this is a silicon photonic crystal. And this is a compound semiconductor actually has a band gap. Uh, so far it's one of the highest band gap material. We call it ultra wide band gap semiconductor. It's beta gallium oxide. And this is indium phosphide fin fat. It was extremely smooth sidewall. And that made the off state work really well. So this fin fat transistor with a very high aspect ratio had a sub threshold, threshold voltage, uh, threshold voltage of almost ideal 63 millivolt per decade compared to ideal, which is 60 at room temperature. And these are some other wide band gap semiconductor, including gallium nitrogen silicon, also made by this method. The surface morphology can be porous, it can be tailored, depending on how you etch it. Uh, and the bottom line is there's no ion, no, no high, high energy ion, no ion induced damage. That's the virtue of that. So here's my statement about MAC etch. It's not your ordinary etching. It can do things that dry etch can, cannot do. All right, so the second platform I want to uh, introduce uh, is, uh, this is actually not just limited to semiconductor. It's a 3D MEMS approach. Uh, um, we use string. A lot of times you want to keep everything flat which is what I actually did for many, many years. Uh, but this is to try to make films not stay flat. So the, the mechanism is uh, very straightforward. If you have a compressibly stringed layer, which is this uh, uh, purple layer over here, and you have uh, uh, the uh, tensile string layer, the, the yellow one, and release it from the mechanical support, the compressive one will want to expand because it was pressed to start with. The tensile one want to pull it back. As a result, you have a momentum in this direction. 
and that makes the film buckle up. And the, this is an array of these buckled up film. We call them rolled up. The reason we call them membrane is because the thickness of these can be anywhere from a monolayer to hundreds of nanometer. We mostly work with pretty thin uh, films, like a, tens of, a, ten, a few nanometer to tens of nanometers. So we call them a, a self rolled up membrane, SROM. Um, this is the model, the structure. Here's some more modeling to, to understand what is the string involved. If you change the thickness, you change the mismatch, uh, you, you, you can even change the temperature you do this at, you get different curvature. And how to, if you know the curvature, you know how long a strip, strip you need to have in order to roll up a complete turn, many turns, or a fraction of a turn. So we got to the point we can control how many turns we roll precisely so we can fabricate devices knowing what we're, we're, we're getting into. So that's the, uh, the approach. And these are some of the, the devices we have made. This is the rolled up inductor. And uh, this is a capacitor structure. This is a transformer. When you have two inductors, a primary, secondary, you make a transformer. And this one is a LC, L, L, middle is C and L filter. Um, we also use this platform for other non-electronic based applications. And this is an array of a silicon nitride tube rolled up in the same mechanism. And here's what we use it for. This is a, a cortical neuron cell and we're watching the neuron cell grow on a glass slide. And the glass slide had these tubes fabricated on top. So you can see this neuron cell, the axon of a cortical neuron cell, find the tube, goes into it, comes out and continue to propagate along the direction defined by the tubes. To me, who work on solid state electronics all the time, seeing these things moving on our devices, uh, it, it's incredible. There are lots of implications of that. And I have another video to show you how much we actually reduce the footprint. So this is actually uh, two inductors over here. It started rolling from the left-hand side and will stop at the end to the right. And this whole strip is a centimeter. When it finishes rolling, it became uh, less than 100 micron in diameter. So that's how much space we're saving. Once we roll it up, it functions as an inductor and we leave this much space to do something else, some other functionality. And so in the same spirit as integrated circuit, we're integrating passive electronic components and we can make L, which is the inductor, C, the capacitor, and how many Ls, how many Cs, uh, all in the same plane and defined by lithography before we roll it up. Then once we know which one connects to which gave you what kind of band uh, uh, filter, we start rolling and integrate them. So there's practically no limit upon the complexity or configuration of LC circuits, which can be made in the manner of best drum. Always one single lithography step. So that, that's the message uh, for the s -ROM. Um, another aspect of nanotechnology I must emphasize is uh, nano started, if you agree, nano started when Richard Feynman said there's plenty of room at the bottom. He's a, he's there, he was a theoretician. Um, at the time, crystal growth was not developed uh, uh, far away from what uh, we are today. And the imaging technique was, there, was not there. So you, you can't see what you're making. But in addition to the imaging techniques, now you can see atomic uh, level structures, you see defects, see atom by atom. The advancement in crystal growth technique, Len knows exactly what I'm talking about. The advancement in crystal growth technique or lack of it is one of the major factors responsible or inhibiting the nanotechnology momentum today. So there are two major uh, growth techniques, uh, MOCVD and B for epitaxial, especially with compound semiconductors. Uh, so my group worked on a lot of the, these nanostructure grown from the bottom up, uh, um, um, electronics, photonics, uh, even on the, on the, the quantum technology right here. Um, so that's the, uh, the other aspect of uh, nanostructure um, that 
enabled by a bottom-up approach. Is my slides not moving now? I might be thinking about something else. All right. Oh, there are different uh, things showing up. Uh, um, so here's my conclusion. I talk about silicon. I went to beyond silicon, which is the, the compound semiconductor. And uh, I didn't go into the details, but you can start with planar MOSFET, then you go to FinFET. Now industry is moving to gate all around and sheet and stacked nanowires. So there, there, there's always innovation, whether it's structural materials, uh, there's always plenty of room all around. With that, I'm going to stop and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Xiuling, for, um, for, for sharing with us the fantastic results uh, from your research, as well as your vision in the semiconductor nanotechnology. Uh, I certainly agree with you, and there's uh, plenty of room beyond silicon. <laughs> so uh, with that, let's move to our next speaker, um, Professor Judy Stowis. Um, from uh, the Macquarie University of Australia. Um, professor Dallas is a professor uh, in physics and also the director of Macquarie Photonics Research Center. So let's firstly watch the video from her. Next, let us cross to the other side of the ocean to Macquarie University, Australia. Since my childhood, I've been asking questions about how the world works. My family have all studied science, and carrying on the tradition, I have introduced my own daughters to science. This is what Professor Judith Doss said in her profile for SPIE. Judith Doss is a professor of physics and director of MQ Photonics Research Center at Macquarie University, Sydney, Australia. She was elected treasurer of Science and Technology Australia from 2017 to 2021. From 2003 to 2017, she was Chief Investigator of the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence for Ultra-High Bandwidth Devices for Optical Systems. She served as President of the Australian Optical Society from 2010 to 2012 and as a member of the AOS Council from 2007 to 2014. Her research achievements include crystal growth and laser operation of a new laser crystal YBYB, etc. To someone pursuing scientific research, she once said, Don't be intimidated. Believe in yourself and your abilities. Once you find your passion, your enthusiasm will be contagious. Okay, so... I need to share was, my screen. Yeah, please go ahead sharing. Sorry, I think I was muted just then, but I was just saying I'm welcoming uh, Professor Judy Stowers to the stage to talk about sensing bio biomolecules with nanoparticles. Judy, please. Okay, can you now share, see my screen? Yes. Very good. Okay, so I'd like to talk about nanoparticles and... Um, First of all, I'd like to explain why nanoparticles are special. We've just heard a little bit more about nanotechnology. So I'm going to then talk about particles which are free, free to move, and then to talk about collective effects of nanoparticles in random lasers. So the first key thing about nanoparticles is that the particle is all surface. So the properties of the material itself don't matter so much because the actual surface of the material is what does all the interactions. And sometimes the surface states of the particles are different than those that would occur in the bulk. And so the properties of the particle as a nanoparticle could be quite different from those of bulk materials, which is definitely quite weird. And part of the reason for that is just the increase in surface area that arises when you make the particles really small. So that's what's shown in the schematic. So the kinds of surface effects that we see could be um, particle solubility, optical emission, um, chemical bonding and interaction, especially sensing the environment is a particularly important feature of nanoparticles. And even the hardness of the particles depends on the size and the, um, the surface effects. 
So that means that nanoparticles are particularly valuable as reactive materials and for catalysis in chemistry, but they're also important in various intracellular functions. Because they're so small, we can put the particles inside cells and do various medical treatments more rapidly. So um, today in Sydney, it's actually very, very rainy and it's flooding. But in 2009, there was a very major dust storm. And this is an unretouched photo of the Sydney Harbour Bridge in a dust storm. And you can see how red the light is. And that's because the light scatters off the particles. So the important thing about the sky being blue is that the light scatters off molecules in the air. But in the dust, the dust is larger and the light that scatters is much more red. And so you see a lot of red colour from the, from the light scattered from the dust particles. So the size of the particles governs the kind of light scattering that occurs, what wavelength of light is scattered and to some extent whether um, there's an angle dependence on the scattering. And so the other important thing about some nanoparticles is that if they're metallic, they have some very interesting surface plasmon resonances. And this is an example. Um, I'll just move that. Um, the Lycurgus cup in the British Museum shows that when the light comes from the front of the cup, the glass in the cup looks green. But when the light comes from the back of the cup, the glass looks red. And the difference is because there are gold particles in the glass and that glass therefore has different transmission and reflection properties, which are absolutely a function of the gold particles in the glass. You can also make the nanoparticles out of semiconductors. So that makes quantum dots. And here's a very pretty photo of some different quantum dots, um, things like cadmium selenide, cadmium sulfides and, and variations on those themes, different sizes, all illuminated with UV light and then they fluoresce at different colours. So they uh, quantum dots, semiconductor nanoparticles absorb and emit light and their colour depends quite sensitively on their size. And you can make the particles, to, you can tailor them to have exactly the properties you want so that you can design the kind of particles you want. So that's why nanoparticles are interesting and we work with nanoparticles interacting with light. I'm going to talk about collective effects of nanoparticles in random lasers. So the first thing is, what is a laser? A laser is um, typically made of a gain material such as um, a, a garnet, um, a, a, Nidimium YAG is a classic laser, a fiber laser is erbium doped glass. There's lots of different materials that can make the gain in the standard laser. And you put it between two mirrors. So that's shown here, that the amplifying material is placed between two mirrors. The light reflects from the mirrors back towards the amplifying material. It gets amplified each time it goes through the material. So the light is emitted in all directions initially, but then it's reflected backwards and forwards between the two mirrors. And selectively, the path that is reflected backwards and forwards is the one that is amplified. So laser stands for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. And that's the amplification process between the mirrors. You then make one of the mirrors partially reflecting and the light comes out as a beam. A random laser, on the other hand, is rather different. So here's a blob with lots of particles in it, and the blob is the amplifying medium. But it doesn't have any mirrors. It just has particles. And if you put the particles into the amplifying medium, the light that's emitted by the amplifier is, is emitted in all directions. It then encounters particles. It scatters. And so then it scatters again, and then it scatters again, and it keeps getting amplified as it scatters, and so its path length in the amplifying material gets increased. And so it can then get amplified because it goes through the amplifying material over you know, lots of time and, and it gets amplified, but the light then doesn't have a particular specific path. It comes out in all directions and it doesn't come out as a beam, it just comes out as a glow. It's partly coherent. The light that comes out of a standard laser is coherent 
but the light coming out of a random laser is partly coherent. It isn't fully coherent, but it still has a threshold. And that's shown here. This is an example from my student's PhD thesis where she shows a threshold effect with the light, um, the energy going in on the x-axis, the horizontal axis, and then the energy coming out on the y-axis. And you can see that there's a change in the slope which is a characteristic of a threshold. And that's what we see for all sorts of lasers. And so that threshold behavior is still there. So how do you make random lasers? You can make random lasers from all sorts of things, but you need to start with a gain material and then you add it to a particle, lots of particles that scatter. So someone has made a random laser out of tumor cells, cancer tumor cells. Someone else has made a random laser out of a piece of cloth. They put dye into a piece of cloth and that cloth, when it's excited with an excitation light, it glows and it gives you the random laser material. Um, I've made a, a random laser out of um, dye mixed with milk and the milk particles actually cause the scattering. I tried to make it out of strawberry milk and it wouldn't work, but it, may, it works with rhodamine dye in milk. And so... These are examples of the kinds of dyes that we use. This is the solid form of the dye, but then you mix it with nanoparticles and a solvent. And then depending on the ratios of the particles and the ratios of the dye, you get a lot of these sort of milky um, solutions. This one's the, the pure dye without any particles. This one's got lots and lots of particles. And so the, um, the actual color of the, the mixture looks a bit different, but it's the same dye. And so Basically, a random laser can work with lots of different kinds of scatterers mixed in with the gain material. But we need enough laser gain and we need refractive index contrast between the particles and the background, so the, the solvent or the mixture that, you're, that it's in. Okay, so I was curious what happens at threshold in a random laser. And so we did measurements of the um, coherence of the, light, of the light. And this is a classic experiment that people do in undergraduate physics labs, which was originally done by Thomas Young to prove that light was a wave. And we are doing it not to prove that light's a wave, but to, to explore this, the coherence of the light. So this is our excitation laser. The green is our excitation laser. We focus it into our sample, which is our dye with particles. And then we collect the light that's emitted using lenses. And then we pass that light through a double slit, which is just two slits close together. And then we image that light onto a CCD camera and we look at the image. Now the photos are shown here. This one's fairly dim. This one's a bit brighter. This is what the um, double slit interference experiment looks like below the laser threshold. And you can't see very much. It's, it's not, it, the fringes are barely there. But as you go above threshold, you see these fringe patterns grow. And in fact, the fringe patterns are absolutely a signature of the coherence of the light. And that's what we see here. We've plotted the uh, visibility of the fringe pattern for a set of different concentrations of particles in the solution. And we see that, for example, we'll take the um, blue one the blue one has a threshold just below 40 millijoules. And the blue one here, this is, this is our pump, our excitation versus output graph, which is showing you the threshold behavior. And we see exactly the same point for our threshold of the blue one. And likewise, the red ones and the green ones have matched thresholds as well. So what we see is at threshold, there's a sudden jump in the coherence of the emission, which says that this is a laser. It's not just a glow. It's actually a laser, but it's just an odd kind of laser. So that's an intriguing idea. And now I want to tell you a little bit about random lasers for sensing. So first of all, I need to tell you about nanoparticles a bit more. These, now I'm going to talk about metallic nanoparticles, silver or gold, but it, it doesn't actually matter. Any conductor will do this, but when I put small particles into an optical field, I tend to get a polarization of the charges in the particles. And that's concentrated on the surface of the particles. So 
I get strong electric fields building up on the surface of the nanoparticles. Those strong electric fields then interact with the gain material that is nearby. And so I get strong enhancement of the electric fields just on the surface of the nanoparticles, which interacts with dye or any other gain material that is near the surface of the nanoparticles. And so by putting nano, gold or, or silver nanoparticles into my dye mixture, I get a super enhancement of the light interaction with the dye. And this is seen here. When I compare similar concentrations of aluminium oxide particles in a, um, a dye laser with silver nanoparticles in a dye laser, you see that the output from the dye laser, the output intensity is way higher for the silver nanoparticles than it is for the aluminium oxide. So aluminium oxide is dielectric, it's just a normal scatterer. The silver is also a scatterer, but it has this plasmonic effect that it concentrates the electric fields on the surface of the particles and strongly enhances the um, engagement with the dye. And so I get a dramatic change in the performance of the laser when I add the gold nanoparticles or silver nanoparticles. So then I think about, here are some, here are some absorption spectra. So I've got, firstly, the purple one is my dye solution absorption. And then the blue one is my fluorescence of the dye. But then I, then I look at what happens when I just have gold nanoparticles in solution. And when you put gold nanoparticles in solution, they also have an absorption. So you, you would sort of say, well, what color is the gold? Well, it actually does have an absorption in the visible. And it's quite sensitive to the size of the particles. This particular one, I think they're about 25 nanometer diameter, but as you change the size of the particles, you will shift that resonance a bit. So what we're doing is we're looking at where does the dye absorb and where does the gold absorb? And we're going to enhance the performance of our laser by taking the light from our green pump laser, which is, is this green line, and it nicely lines up with where the gold absorbs and that helps to transfer energy into the dye and then we detect the emission from the blue. So we're getting an energy transfer process between the metal particles and the dye molecules and that influences how the, the laser performs. Um, so now I want to introduce the idea of using the gold nanoparticles in a solution as a sensor for another molecule. So the molecule I'm interested in is this molecule here, it's called dopamine. It's a very important neurotransmitter in your brain. Dopamine is a good thing in your brain, it makes you happy, but the right level of dopamine is very important. And it's really quite difficult to measure dopamine because the level or the concentration of dopamine is quite low. It, it occurs at the nanomolar level in your brain. So it's quite hard to measure it, but it's also important that it be measured accurately, particularly in the diagnosis and treatment of people with Parkinson's disease, which is a common um, disease and there is a treatment for it, but monitoring the way the treatment works depends on knowing the levels of dopamine or just waiting for whether the patient gets better, which is not as efficient. So now what I'm going to show you here is what happens when you put gold particles into a solution of dopamine of different concentrations. So the same amount of gold, but different concentrations of dopamine. And you see that the particles change as the dopamine concentration increases. So what's going on? And this is, this is just a picture of the, the, the solutions, but here is a, a, a slide showing you the spectra. And from the, the black one, which is zero moles of dopamine, so this is just your gold, and that's what you saw in the slide before. Then I increase the dopamine and this peak drops. So the gold particles no longer have that resonance, but they shift to a longer resonance, a, a reddish color resonance. So why do they shift to that resonance? And the answer is because the gold, 
the particles of the gold start sticking to the dopamine. They're attracted to these polar, polar molecule parts of the dopamine, NH2 and OH is a, a very polar, and they attract to the metallic gold particles. And so the gold sticks together and it starts to aggregate. And so here's what it looks like with no dopamine. And here's what it looks like as you increase the dopamine, you get the gold particles sticking together with the dopamine holding it together as the glue. And now what we do is thinking about that, we use this with our random laser. And so we put the gold particles and the dopamine in with the dye solution and we already know that gold, gold particles with dye makes a very efficient laser. But what we need to do is then detect how much dopamine is added. And so what we're seeing here is sort of the molecular pattern that you've got a reddish one versus a bluish one. The reddish one doesn't have, it hasn't aggregated, but the bluish one has started to aggregate. And these are sort of funny clumps. But the color literally depends on how big the clumps are. And so I said to you that the color depended on the size of the particles. These particles are bigger, the color is different. So then what happens when we run our random laser? The random laser emission is um, peaked as you increase your pump power and you can work out where your threshold is for each one. And then you can plot those graphs of input versus output for different concentrations of dopamine. And you can work out where the threshold is for each of the concentrations of dopamine. And what we found was that the random laser threshold depends very sensitively on the gold aggregation and the dopamine concentration. And we can increase our sensitivity by three orders of magnitude or more by doing a random laser measurement versus doing the colorimetry, which was that original spectra. So the original vi visible UV spectra work, but they only work down to about 10 to the minus four molar. We need to get down to 10 to the minus nine molar. And to do that, we use the collective behavior of the random of the, of the nanoparticles, and we amplify the response of those nanoparticles by doing a random laser measurement. And so that's a it's a way of increasing the sensitivity of our detection dramatically. And so this is the, um, sorry, that has shifted because that line should lie over the black points. Something has happened to my graph, sorry. Um, I'm, my apologies that the line should lie on the black points, which makes no sense otherwise. Um, but what you see is there's actually a linear trend in the log scales. Um, for dopamine sensing over five orders of magnitude. So we have a very sensitive mechanism for measuring dopamine. And um, this is just using the gold nanoparticles in the random laser. So that's an example of applying nanoparticles to a sensing challenge. And I've told you a little bit about why nanoparticles are of interest because their surfaces do all the interesting engagement with the environment. And we can see that if we can do collective effects of the nanoparticles, we can enhance the sensitivity of detection. So at this point, I would like to thank my collaborators, in particular, Juan Zakia Juan Ismail, who is now a lecturer in Malaysia, and my collaborator, Charlotte Huro, who has um, completed her PhD and is now working in an engineering firm in France, and Professor Eva Golders, who's my colleague at, at, um, in Sydney, and I also acknowledge funding sources. So I was going to add a little bit about my career progress. So to give you an idea of my background, I'm Australian and I completed my schooling in regional New South Wales. I studied a BSc honours degree, which is a four year degree in physical chemistry. But in the middle of that, I spent one year working in a pharmaceutical company doing organic chemistry. And then I sort of moved away from organic chemistry towards something more physical. And I did my fourth year project at ANU and in using a high power laser, that was amazing. And I became fascinated by lasers in that year. I've worked with lasers ever since. So I really love working with lasers. They're really interesting. It's not just that they're pretty. A lot of the lasers I work with are infrared, but they're fascinating. They've got a dynamic response to what you do to them that is amazing. And in my PhD degree, I um, built a high power laser. 
During my PhD, I spent one year in Rochester, New York, working at the Laboratory for Laser Energetics, and I worked with Professor, Professor Gerard Maru and Bob Knox. Um, and that was the year that Donna Strickland did all her work with Gerard on the Nobel Prize, the um, pulse compression of light in optical fibres. So that was, that was that year. It was a very um, momentous year. I mean, not we didn't know that at the time that she would win the Nobel Prize, but it was a very momentous year for me because I met my future husband. It was also a really exciting time because we, I learned so much in that one year working at this very large lab. And I'm very grateful to the Rotary Foundation for sending me. Um, Rochester gets a lot of snow and that's a picture of snow. That was a shock, but anyway. Um, working as, as an academic, I did a postdoc at the University of Toronto uh, and then I returned to Sydney and uh, worked at Macquarie University and have, grad have been there ever since and I've gradually been prom promoted to professor. I teach optics and physics and I teach everybody from first year to master's level. Today I've uh, done a two-year tutorial in, mass, in first year and then I've done a one-year class in a master's class. So I, I do everything. Um, over my career, I've successfully supervised more than 30 research students at all ranges. Many of them have gone on to work in industry and academic positions. Some have gone on to different kinds of careers like um, becoming doctors or lawyers, patent lawyers, or one of them became a stand-up comedian. So they've done a range of different things. In my research career, I've done a range of things. Because I started off in chemistry, I've worked on the boundary between chemistry and physics. A lot of my work has been around, around materials, but also around medicine. So I've worked on um, patents for laser-cured solder, solders for microsurgical tissue repair. So this is a picture of a nerve that got cut, and then we joined it back together with a dye-doped protein as a sort of a glue, and then we used a laser to sort of set the protein so that it held together while the nerve recovers. And this works quite well. Um, we've also worked on opals. This is a synthetic opal, which is a, a, just a nice array of polystyrene spheres, all the same size. We've worked on crystal growth. This is the crystal furnace. Um, we actually grew our own Iterbium Yab crystals, and that was really exciting. This is a, a brighter laser. Um, this is a photonic crystal fibre. So there's a range of different things. Um, contributing to my community has also been an important part of my career. And there I've worked on, I've worked in professional societies. I was past president of the Australian and New Zealand Optical Society and formerly treasurer of Science and Technology Australia. But I've also worked in um, my Centre of Excellence, QDOS, which is an um, it, it ran for many years as a, as a sort of a group of six university staff from six different universities working on photonics and applications of photonics, so high bandwidth optical devices. Here is um, a, a lovely collage of the women in QDOS, which I, um, that group was the group that I led as one of my mentoring type activities. And I was also director of outreach for QDOS. So we held a showcase, which, um, showcased all the work across QDOS and we invited various industry people to join. But on the other hand, we also did things like this picture, which is a laser maze. So you set up a, a reasonable, a, a moderate power um, semiconductor laser in the visible with mirrors, you turn on a smoke machine and, and you um, encourage kids to navigate their way through this laser maze. And if they block the beam, the music stops. And so you've got a detector detecting the light at the far end. And if they block the beam, then the detector signal stops the music. And so this is a great fun activity for kids. So I've done a lot of work like that as well. Um, my family, we have two daughters. They're now wonderful young women. And I will say life as an academic with a young family is challenging. And I sympathize with those of you with young families right now who've had to work through a pandemic that is incredibly challenging. I worked part-time for some years and I have a supportive employer. I have a wonderful partner and I have family members who've helped with childcare over the years. So I found it very rewarding, but I will say it can be challenging. So um, 
I, I encourage you to, to seek a, a full and balanced life, which includes some kind of a family life as well as a career. Thank you for listening. And today I'd like to celebrate International Women's Day and thank you for inviting me to speak to you. Thank you very much, Judith. Um, that this is amazing to see that you got lazing uh, from milk. <laughs> very impressive. Um, to my understanding, Judith, you're going to probably won't be able to join the panel discussion after that due to other commitments. So maybe I will take this opportunity to represent the audience to ask you a few questions, <laughs> if you don't mind. Okay, so it's, it's really from my own interest. I would like to first ask you, how do you define um, partly coherence here is that from the line width so how do you do that um, I was looking at the visibility of the fringes but what you're effectively doing and what I think is happening in the laser itself is you've got a broad background that is incoherent it is simply yeah. spontaneous emission and then amplified spontaneous emission just broad going wherever so that's the background and then on top of that, you've got the laser modes in the random laser. And so they're superimposed over a broad background and you get this mixture. Right. And so what I think is happening is that you've got a superposition of both coherent and incoherent beams. So I think that's why it's partially coherent. So it's just some particular modes has been really, really amplified. And then yeah. the laser. And, that, okay. and if, you, if you could isolate just that mode and you could just pull out that mode, you'd find it was probably quite coherent, but it's hard. It's yeah, hard in yeah. the geometry I have to do that. Yeah. And also uh, most of the work I can see is actually done in the solution, right? So uh, is there any actually other sort of um, potential that's actually in, embed your, your, your particles into a probably not solid state to sort of... <laughs> oh, no, definitely. Yeah, yeah no, there's yeah. lots of opportunities. Um, yeah. One of the things we've done is to make uh, thin films with um, uh, PMMA or PVA film spin cast and you can embed particles nanoparticles into that and you can mix your gain material whether it's a dye or or even another nanoparticle you can mix the the material into that uh, we've also introduced the uh, dye into a hollow core optical fiber and then and what's magic about that is you mix a dye solution and you introduce it into a hollow core fiber the hollow core on its own won't guide. So you put a photonic crystal around the hollow core to keep it guiding, which is mm -hmm. minor detail, not hard, not, not easy to accomplish all of that, but you do that. And then um, what you find is as you add the nanoparticles, the threshold of the laser goes down. And that's really, really intriguing because you think, oh, it should go up, but it doesn't, it goes down. And why? Because you've increased the paths for the amplification. So you can make a laser in a fiber and people have made random lasers in telecoms fiber and they're relying on random defects in the fiber over a long length and those random defects scatter and then you can then just build a random laser from a piece of telecom fiber so there's there's all kinds of things you can make a random laser from yeah very interesting. So that leads to my next question. Is that possible then make an electrically injected laser? Ah, okay. Um, I don't tend to work with electrical injection, but I don't see why not, because you can certainly make semiconductor nanoparticles in, in a solid phase. You can make a, a film of them or just um, embed them even in another material. Mm. And then you would excite them. So if you can make a quantum dot laser, you should be able to put lots of quantum dots close to each other and you should be able to make that laser. So I don't see why not, but it's not something I've done. And yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm not yeah. familiar yeah. with whether anyone else has done it. I, I, I can't say yes or no. I don't know. Sure. Yeah. That, that's interesting. I might just read a bit more about your work in this space because we make some, you know, um, nanowire based, basic 3D structure. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah play emitting it's like light emitting diode so i was thinking of whether that mixture with some oh, of i think that would work yes yes, yes. that would be oh, really, really interesting explore yes. yes yes that would be fun yeah okay cool i might just get in touch some stage sometime okay. in discussion okay so now that's that's probably my question about your your presentation uh certainly i also want to um 
uh, before I let you go to ask you about, because you have got a long uh, successful career in science as a scientific researcher, and you've mentioned in some of your in final um, slides talking about various important issues, um, the, the things related to uh, women, um, young women yeah. scientists or people pursuing career in science. So I think, do you have any final sort of uh, wisdom to share? Um, and advice to the, you know, young girls getting into scientific world. Um, what is your, yeah, to strong honest, message to that? Yes. To be honest, it looks like in the past I tracked my path and I just made a, a progressive path towards success. As I was doing it, it just felt like I was doing the next thing. And I was looking around going, what's the best thing to do next? Oh, this is interesting. I'll do that. And it didn't occur to me that I would become a professor. I didn't expect to become a professor, but I really enjoyed working with lasers. And so I stayed in the university and worked with lasers. And what was the next thing? It was going to another place and learning how to work with lasers in the other place. And so I didn't have a path to a successful career mapped out in my head and I just stepped on the steps. I just made decisions as I went about what did I think would be a great opportunity or um, tried, I tried to work hard when I got the opportunity. So I tried to make the best of each opportunity I had. But I think, I think have confidence that you can find a satisfactory and satisfying career. And it doesn't maybe look like the one you thought you were going to have, but you make choices as you go. And I think be patient with yourself. The period with the pandemic has been really horrible for everybody. So be patient with yourself. It might not go, might, might not go right first go, but give yourself chances to have another go and keep trying. Because I, I think you can make a successful career with many different shapes and many different paths. Great. That's that's wonderful, Judith. I think that's uh, resonant a lot with my own experience. You know, it's just follow your passion and your curiosity yeah. and then make the best of it. Thank you so much, Judith, for joining us today. And I think I could let you go now. And okay. uh, have a great day, rest of the day. <laughs> thank you for the invitation. Okay. Thank you. Best See you. Okay. Now I'd like to invite all the panel back to the stage. Oh, sorry, I forgot. Uh, we have one more speaker. <laughs> I'm really sorry for that because um, um, I've got another speaker, wonderful speaker, <laughs> Professor Yu Hongbai. Um, she is um, actually not only a professor, but also now she is uh, actually director of the Light Publishing Group of SIAMP and also the chief editor of journal Light Science and Application. So let's firstly watch her video. This lady personifies intellectual elegance. Though small in stature, she has a tremendous energy that is envied by most who work with her. At work, she is tireless, never afraid of rejections or failures. Her clear vision and amazing perseverance has made her a well-known figure not only in the Chinese publishing industry, but also the world optics community. She is Professor Yu Hongbai, director of the Light Publishing Group. In 2012, the journal Light Science and Applications was born in China. Within a few years, it has won recognition and prestige, and is now one of the top 100 journals in the world. With an impact factor of 17.782 in 2021, it is also one of the top three optical journals and has been so for seven consecutive years. These achievements are the direct results of the hard work of Professor Bai, who had the courage to dream big and the practical knowledge to turn that dream into reality. As the founder of the journal LSA, she has managed to form an editorial board which consists of many respected optical scientists, both in China and elsewhere in the world paving a solid foundation for the journal's development. By now, LSA has truly become one of China's most internationally influential scientific and technological journals, a world-leading optical journal, and has been featured by domestic and foreign media such as People's Daily and Japan's NHK TV. Sponsored by the Light Publishing Group, the Light Conference is a much-anticipated annual gathering for optical experts from internationally renowned academic organizations and universities. 
So far, more than 5,000 experts from more than 30 countries have attended, building a platform for academic exchanges and scientific research cooperation. In recent years, the Light Publishing Group has been focusing on new optical interdisciplinary and advanced manufacturing, launching e-light and light advanced manufacturing, setting up new overseas offices, and building up quite a fan base with the journal's overseas social media accounts. Whilst normal offline academic exchanges are impeded by the raging pandemic, the Light Publish Group has launched a series of online activities such as the Light Online Classes, Doctoral League, Optical Future Stars, and Light People. Over the years, Professor Yu Hongbai has been able to lead the Light Publishing Group to steady development by keeping pace with the times and constantly learning from established overseas journals. She is determined to build the Light Publishing Group into a leading international publishing brand with distinctive Chinese characteristics to help the development of the world's optical industry. Outside of her busy work, Professor Bai is a keen lover of ballet, yoga, and meditation. In work and leisure, she gives 100% to all her undertakings. Even at the top of her chosen profession, she remains true to herself, which, according to her, is the only proven way to make one's dream come true. That was a great pirouette in the end, <laughs> Yuhong. <laughs> um, so now let's welcome Yuhong to the stage to talk about a light journey. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for Professor Lan's warm and kind introduction. I'm Yu Hongbei, a group leader of Light Publishing Group, which published seven of its journals. I'm one of founding person and chief editor of journal Life Science and Applications. Today, we are getting together to celebrate International Women's Day Taking this special moment, I'd like to share some stories about myself and journal life science and applications. I have been very proud of myself about daring to dream. Back in 2008, funding a globally visible science journal seems impossible in China, but I have some friends who are great scientists from all over the world. They told me, why not? From that time, I started to seek resources from CLMP and publishers and taking a long journey from 2008 to 29th March 2012. The day Life Science and Applications was launched, co-published by CLMP and Nature Publishing Group. Now, 10 years after its founding, ELSA has evolved to be an essential and visible resource for community. What do we want? Take a foothold in China to be, to see the world to be a science media with impact. Today, I'm delighted to highlight 10 things for the past 10 years with emotion and enthusiasm. Superb editorial board, authors, reviewers, and readers, annual light conference, support young scientists, special issues and columns, funding partner of UNESCO's International Year and International Day of Light, Light Online Talks, Global Resources, New Sister Journals, Ghost Power in my office. First, our superb editorial board, 
I'd like to express my congratulations and appreciations to our editorial board members and the regional editors. Since the beginning, ELSA has adopted editorial board members and in-house editors co-working mechanism. It's their devotion and efforts that made ELSA success. Since 2015, ELSA reached out and set up regional offices in leading branches of optics. Those offices were founded in Rochester, London, Edinburgh, Sydney, Paris, Singapore, Beijing, Shanghai, Chengdu, Zhengzhou, Nanjing, Hong Kong, Tainan, and Xiamen, which supplied ELSA's extension with ad hoc editors. I fully believe that the journal's quality is dependent on the editor's quality. With such outstanding qualification from our editors, Elsa achieves her new milestones. I'm deeply saddened that Professor Mark Stockman from Georgia State University, Professor John Lau from Australia National University, and Professor Tom Grickewals from University of Amsterdam unfortunately passed away during their editor's term. And I express my heartfelt condolences for my beloved three friends. Especially, I'd like to say how fondly remembers to Professor John Lau, for he was not only my host when I was a visiting scholar in 2006 at Australia National University, but also like my godfather from 2006 until 2016 when he passed away in 10 years. I dare to say, I will not realize how important an international outstanding academic journal to China if he didn't lead me to the world. His first visit to CLMP occurred in 2005. And after that, he visited Changchun every year until a Saturday, June 19th, 2016, that we lost him forever. And he will live in my heart go on and on. Second, authors, reviewers, and readers. Over the past decade, Elsa has published over 1,000 research and review manuscripts submitted by more than 1,600 institutions in 58 countries. It's worldwide authors' high-level contributions that fundamentally nourish ELSA. It's the reviewers and the readers that help improve manuscripts. And I thank our readers for keeping a very close attention on ELSA's papers and always sending us their first-hand feedback for that. Elsa might be among the few journals which issued a regular Best Readers Award each month. Maybe you wondered who qualified for this award. My answer is one, who provides constructive suggestion for Elsa in improving its quality or impact. All the proof of promoting Elsa in public social science media, conferences, and published articles in any way, are all welcome to apply for this Best Readers Award. The two photos showed our authors promoting ELSA on the conferences. Third, in 2011, while we were still preparing for launching ELSA, we initiated the light conference. This annual conference grew from friends gathering and brainstorming about science and the journal into annual event with more than attracted 400 attendees per year. Due to COVID, like conference was unfortunately canceled for two years. But we hold faith that the joint endeavors of our community will bring the day that all friends from different countries gather together in person back to being possible. We started the Young Scientist Award, Young Scientist Forum, 
and a very prominent event of Rising Stars of Light. The Rising Stars of Light is a worldwide campaign for the shining young scientists in optics. Since 2018, it has been hosted for four years and influenced more than 600,000 audiences all around the world. And is now listed as a featured event by UNESCO's International Day of Light. Many of our selected candidates have quickly established themselves and accomplished exciting works. We are delighted to see their contributions to the optics community. We have been trying to spot those emerging and transformative topics to lead the optical researchers. Among the featured issues, the first paper of the digital coding mathematics published in 2014 and lead to more than 1,400 citations, bridging the physical and digital worlds. This work elected as OSS annual science and technology book breakthrough elected as China's annual science and technology breakthrough, super hot paper by ESA, ESA. In 2014, I was invited to be the funding committee member of UNESCO's International Year of Light, and ELSA naturally became the golden partner of International Year of Light. We contributed to the global promotion of optics. Later, we further invited co found the International Day of Light. At each International Day of Light, 16th May, ELSA organizes highlighted events. Despite the COVID, 2020, Lighting the Blue Forum, and 2021, International Day of Light Conference were hosted on site. During the COVID, we took the initiative and launched Light Online Talks in early 2020. Since then, many different lectures and webinars have been hosted, which attracting millions of audience. By far, we have established multi-channel resources for promoting the journal and its paper, such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and WeChat, as well as your alert. ELSA has gained high visibility all around the world. Nine, in 2021, the same team of ELSA launched two new sister journals for different purposes. Launched by Siam and Springer Nature, ELIT reports the emerging and multidisciplinary topics and targets groundbreaking research. Launched by Zihua Lab and CLN, light advanced manufacturing focus on light-based manufacturing. Each paper will enjoy web publication fee, cover story, free of print, invited news and views highlighting light science and applications, free news promotion through major science and photos and social media. Actually, these two journals already lead to high citations and numbers of downloads, even though we launched and published for only a few months. Last but not least, my final credit goes to my editorial office staff, especially two thirds of them are girls, but they are powerful. With their extraordinary contribution, dedication and service, Elsa lives from safe harbor and sails in endless oceans. 10 years is a short period in modern history, but what has been done in this period could change a new generation of researchers. Looking back at the past decade, the whole Elsa team can proudly say that we have tried our best and wholeheartedly served the people in science and we have achieved our primary goal. We have made successful progress. Some of it couldn't have even dreamed of 10 years ago. I'm confident that ELSA will still be able to open our eyes wide in the future and inspire us to say, look, 
what a wonderful job Elsa has done. Thank you very much. Thank you, the organizer, give me this opportunity to take part in this event. Special thanks goes to Professor Haixia Zhang, Professor Lan Fu, and Ms. Hui Wang. Wish all of us happy International Women's Day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Yu Hongbai, for a really, really nice um, reflection of the whole journey uh, for developing this really pre uh, prestigious journal uh, actually in the field. And I, I would say your leadership, your hard working, and you know, it's it really make this um, possible. Uh, one thing also I would like to let you know that, you know, in your memory of uh, Professor John Love from ANU, I'm not sure whether you know this year that Professor John Love actually has been awarded the member of Australia, Australian Award um, for post posthumously um, uh, and for recognizing of his significant service to tertiary education, particular physics. So that's a great, you know, um, great award to reflect the appreciation that uh, for John's contribution. Okay, with that, now I think I'd like to invite all our panels back all our presenters actually this morning back to form a panel discussion. So, okay, so now hopefully you can see um, everyone on the screen. So um, it's a great pleasure for me today. Also, again, to, to chair this uh, panel discussion. Uh, first of all, uh, we would like to really discuss a wide range of um, you know, issues, hopefully, and to, to share a lot of uh, your um, your, your journey actually as a, as a scientific researcher um, in the field. So I think my first question um, to the panel is uh, why do you choose to participate in our this special um, event in um, Rosing Science? So do we have any voluntary to make uh, comments? My I can is... start. <laughs> sure. Um, in Shizhou first, and then we go to go to your home. Yes. Go ahead. Okay. So it is actually the same reason why I applied to this Optica Ambassador Program. I, I was always interested in uh, reaching out all the people from all around the world because it's uh, also contributes to my uh, career. <clears throat> the way that I look to the world, it also affects my point of view to learn from different people. I heard your event through Optica, and when I heard it and invited, I accepted, uh, because I wanted to share my experiences, and I, I, I also wanted to learn from you. Right, yes. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure like, you know, people will reach out um, by, you know, also saying your presence at this platform. Uh, you home? Yeah, thank you. Any comments? Yes. Actually, to be honest, this is not my first time to take part in Rosing Science event. I was the first speaker when the event was launched in 2017. Back to the beginning, I thought it was a great idea when Ms. Wang talked to me about planning an event named Rosing Science. Ms. Wang and I, we used to work together and we understand each other very well. So I'd like to support her if I could. Thank you. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I know you have quite a long engagement with this um, events, and this is actually the first time I joined this event, and I really enjoyed it very much. Um, so um, uh, all of us, I guess, in the panel is actually doing uh, different um, research. Uh, we're doing some, you know, uh, publications also related to the research work, and so. Uh, I guess my question is about uh, when and uh, when and why you actually decided or choose to actually work in the science and research field. Yeah, I will take this one. Uh, yeah. I think the reason are kind of pretty simple. I think I followed my heart at each uh, different time of my life. Or uh, it might be short sighted, or shallow at that moment, but I really just chose a field that I chose a direction that I don't think I will regret later. 
uh, or if I chose something else, I will be regretful that I did something else. So I like physics. Uh, when I was young, I think it's cool to understand like how, how the world is working. And then when I enter my undergrad, I just think, oh, optical engineering, how can you engineer light, right? It just seems uh, fantastic or impossible <laughs> to me at that moment. So I think it's a really cool name and direction. So I just walked into it. And then our uh, choosing my like PhD career is also I came across like integrated photonics. Uh, I think, oh, how can you deal with light at such a small scale? Uh, and I just picked that. I think it's very simple. Yeah, I think I follow my heart and I think I follow something that I think, oh, it is so cool. And I want to I, I, I just want to pursue this. Uh, and if I don't do this, I will be I will I will regret. Yeah. I think uh, follow on. I mean, early on, Judy was uh, Judith was mentioned like she was never she hasn't never really decided that she wants to be a scientist from the first place. So she basically followed the followed the path. And um, is that the same as you? It looks like from your presentation, you mentioned like you early on you had a dream you want to do you know science something. So have you already when you're young have sort of this kind of dream you want to be uh, you know scientist sometimes in the future? And then you sort of uh, tailor your um, design, your pathway um, uh, towards that. Do you have that or? Yeah, I think I think so. I think it's just what I was I, I was ex more exposed to science and engineering. But I think if I was exposed to other things, I might fall in love with that as well. So uh, it's hard to tell. I think if I end up in somewhere else, I could also do well and not necessarily I need to be a professor. Uh, I don't think there's any like there's so many opportunities that one can pursue and you can do well and don't really limit it, uh, yourself to just certain paths or uh, always keep an open minded but you are always being influenced by what you are exposed to and what uh, what your peers are doing or what kind of role model you're seeing along the way right there is just four right. different things yeah sure oh you want to add something Ishin Su? Okay, so I have a fun fact about me actually. So my name is in Turkish, it is Ishin Su. And yeah. it means that it is like combination of two words. Ishin means that ray of light and Su means water. So I, I was always interested in science too as a kid. And it is apparent that it was like, it was like a destiny, I can say, because the, my name like includes ray of light and I'm working with lasers right now. It's a kind of fun fact about me. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that's great. But, you know, what, what if, like, you didn't choose science, right? And uh, is there anything else you actually you think you, you, you want to, to do, uh, cooking or uh, as a chef, or what's the other? <laughs> what, uh, what other profession you might actually try to, to pursue then? Actually, I improved my cooking skills during the pandemic. <laughs> I, I think a lot of people do that. <laughs> I learned a lot of new things. So, uh, like, similar to other guests, uh, I was, like, always interested in nature. When I was a child, I was observing around, like, animals, sky, everything. And if I... If I'm uh, if I didn't choose a career in science, probably I would like to be a wildlife photographer because I really like to. I'm actually I have a binocular and I observe birds and other like animals around. I like to go uh, out and have a walk. Um, so probably I, I would uh, choose a career in a like wildlife photography. <laughs> oh, <to observe. laughs> sure. <laughs> That's great. Uh, anyone else wants to add on this? Sure, Sandra, please. Yes, uh, maybe I should choose. I love teaching also. Uh, mm. So I and also I love kids. So I, I maybe I I, I to be a, a teaching or primary teaching. I I know I don't know, <laughs> but I love <laughs> teaching also. And I'm thinking how to explain to to different. Uh, class of a person of different uh, knowledge. So uh, I maybe I will be a teacher of school teacher. Sure, that's, that's nice. So, so do you teach as well at the moment? Uh, and of yes, yes, I, I, I teach uh, also, yes, I, I'm a mathematician. And, uh, I teach uh, different uh, disciplines because sometimes I'm in the first uh, part of the career of biology or chemistry or physics. Mm. So I teach analysis to different careers and I love that. 
um, sometimes mathematicians don't like that, but I love it because I look uh, the way they think and it's very, it makes me grow also, as I mentioned in my talk. So uh, at, at my first part of my career, I loved all the things theoretical. And then when I was um, changing my mind and say, well, I think it, that theoretical things are very important to have a, a base. But I was always worried because I wanted to see application something and touchable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's the way then why I switched my career because I needed to see something applied, not only in theory. Sure, because I can see from your, your work currently is that just uh, really have a great application in various sort of um, re research, you know, benefit for a lot of researchers, I guess, using microscope. Like, so you, so are you collaborating with a lot of uh, research grouping actually doing experimental work? Or? Yes, yes. Uh, the photonic lab uh, works with, they have their own uh, two photon microscope. I only do the mathematics or the post process. I just use the algorithm that we develop. And, uh, but uh, there are a lot of microscopes and type of imaging that can use this uh, post process that it, it is uh, a post process after you took the image, then you, you can super resolve that process. And I understand um, a little bit of the application, but uh, I, I like to listen to people who, who is using what you, you something touchable uh, after you do the math, there is something that they can do with that and see yeah. more than the microscope. That's, that's the, the key idea of the method. Yeah. Sure, yeah, great. Um, so my next question to the panel is, um, uh, what do you think is the, you know, what, what do you think are the essential quality of an excellent research scientist? So if you, what is the most important quality? Anyone has, um, I'm pretty sure a lot of you have actually your, your own sort of observation over the years of research and uh, I think about, you know, being a great scientist, what is the most oh, this person has this very important quality that make him or her successful. And then, you know, for me, one of the things is about persistence um, and curiosity. And Xiuling, I have to say you turn on the microphone, please. All right, ahead. yeah, uh, you basically said the, uh, well, <laughs> yes, to, to the uh, excellence, but just step back a, a little. If I knew the answer when I pick graduate students, well, I wish I, I did. So it's very hard when you when when we tell people what we think will make an excellent researcher, you can say it, everybody seems to understand that, but to be able to do that, that is something different. To be able to tell who's better suited for this type of research, who's better suited for another type, because there are different kinds of research. But when you said persistence, is definitely out of all the characteristics, I think that I would rate that number one. You can be really smart, you can be really creative, but if you give up easily, you're never gonna go anywhere. So that, that, that is the number one quality. The second thing you just said, the curiosity, you have to ask good questions. You have to have questions, you have to ask them the question in the, in the right direction almost. If, if you ask way too many questions, so there are bad questions and good questions, you're never gonna move on. So you need to, for students, if you really want to publish, you have to take it to the publishable end. And how do you get there before other people do? That's how you publish it, which is, this is a very microscopic view of that instead of changing the world, which is another way. To, to ask questions, uh, we need both. You have to think big, you have to be observant of the little things, but you cannot be trapped and want to know every single detail before you make the next decision. So that, that, that's another, and along with that, because you cannot, you will not have the time to look into every single detail to understand the phenomenon fully before you make your next decision, you got to have the mindset to take risks. And that risk is something, if you take the risk and you have opportunity, you have to embrace the opportunity. So, so uh, all of these are really good char characteristics. That, again, it's easy to say, hard to do, but if you 
keep reminding yourself, reminding your students. Uh, maybe you'll make a difference in somebody else's life. Exactly. I guess a lot of things you can also develop on the way, right? It's no, nobody's born to be like that, but you learn. Unless you have a name, like it's seen, you, <laughs> it's seen you, you're born to do laser. That, that's true. <laughs> yeah, I'm joking. <laughs> Thanks, Julie. Anyone wants to add on? Yeah, I think I, of course, echo that. I just want to add one more thing I think is really important, which is, I think, communication skills. And that comes in many perspectives. Uh, you have to be able to, let's say you have a data, you have to be able to tell like, different kinds of stories about the data. It's really about what you tell, what you, uh, like, with something you have. And also, like, you have to be effectively communicate with your peers, your lab mates, who you know how to get help and how to help people through um, like our uh, through communication. Uh, they're also like how can you convey like broader audience? Let's say you go to a conference, you talk to uh, people outside of your field. How can you uh, convince people what you're doing is impactful? Uh, that's I think it's also important. Uh, yeah, I think communication, whether you can really express yourself and exp express your work and then tell like impactful stories is also, I think, very important. Yeah, I think surprisingly being smart, maybe ranked number six or five. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to add a point to, to that one. O over the years, we participate in student committees and all, all that. Communi good communication doesn't mean you speak perfect English or perfect any other language. It is the logic, how you express yourself in a logical way. People mm -hmm. have the patience to listen to you. So don't be afraid to speak. That, that just speak in the way you think it makes sense. That, that's good communication. I can't agree any more. I can't agree more about that point, you know. <laughs> yes, it's in so. I was going to add that actually it's similar to communication. You should be open to criticism too. Because when you attend conferences, you can receive negative feedbacks, negative comments from your peers, from your advisor. You should be open to criticism. You should learn from your mistake, mistakes. If you are like dev devastated very easily, it's not going to work out. It is an important thing, I believe, to learn if you make a mistake in the lab, in the experiment, in the calculation. You should like sit down and understand why, why I did this mistake. And then you, uh, I think, I think after that you can continue. Uh, it, it is also another um, like property of a good scientist. I believe to be open for criticism. Yeah, I think yeah, that great. also comes to a point of like stress handling, like how much, how 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 can you mentally <laughs> handle stress? Where there's a lot of frustrations, so stress uh, during our scientific research. You might have um, everybody have imposters. Imposter, syn uh, imposter syndromes and how do you like, overcome it and, um, and like, yeah, do greater work, yeah. Yes, <laughs> that's true actually. And doing research is um, you, you fail probably more than you succeed. So you need to be able to handle that, <laughs> that sort of, you know, stress and depression sometimes from failure and then move on sort of things. So it's great um, point as, as well. Uh, so, so in your opinion, um, you know, we were talk, talk, particular talk, talking about, you know, women here. Um, so what do you see over your over years, your observation of, you know, what is the key strength for actually uh, women scientists or, you know, women doing research? And what are actually main challenges maybe that's um, facing uh, women when they're doing science? Have you observed something really particular about your, you know, you know, female students who actually exhibit some very special quality or <laughs> as friends during research? Um, and what do you foresee that, or you, what do you see is actually a key ch challenge when people are actually doing that? Yeah, I think I have one comment. I think it's being like, you are in dead will be influenced that you're being the minority of your surroundings, like you go to a conference, went to a panel discussion, even go to a faculty, like faculty in, uh, faculty interview, like there is, you just have to face like a lot of people that are a panel that majority are male. And that actually 
really are affects you like mentally or in a way that might be subconscious, but it really could affect your confidence or, um, it, I mean, it's certainly like improving, but it's still, we still have a long way to go. Yeah. I'm glad you actually talked about that because I, uh, I mean, personally, I, share exactly the same feeling, especially when you're pretty young as a student, as an early career researcher, and those kind of imbalance um, environment that's quite intimidating a lot of the times. And then that's certainly one of the big, big challenge, I think, for, for people who just feel like they don't feel comfortable, right? When you go to a conference and when you go to a job interview. So that's also related to how we actually can um, really promote more participation of, um, you know, females into um, especially science um, in technology, the field of that, um, to improve the presence. And also that will probably will release a little bit of pressure and make, encourage people to continue on, I guess. That's one of really biggest challenge, I think. But from your personal experience, is anything else like related to, of course, the nature of being a female? We've got probably more pressure from, you know, um, society, also from a family perspective. You know, how do you think, is that a real challenge or actually, you know, is, we shouldn't take it as a challenge? I mean, it is a challenging situation, but it's just something in nature in our life we have to do. So what's your reflection on that? So um, I have a comment here. I think, uh, first of all, we should change the view of a scientist in people's mind. They usually imagine white, old male person as a scientist. And for example, uh, I was supervising a lab after my PhD and I, I was the, like, the, let's say, main manager of the lab. When a visitor comes from outside, and if I'm with other students and they are usually male students, engineering or physics students, they will shake hands with the male students because they will think that they are the manager of the lab. And they, they were explaining to the visitor that, oh no, no, she, she is uh, the supervisor. And I'm like, yes, I am the supervisor. So this is kind of light example in my opinion because I heard a lot of like worse harassment stories as you mentioned, because we have a, we are a minority in a scientific community. There are, of course, worse examples. I think first we should uh, like break down this white male old scientist image in people's minds. And that just happened to me today with a salesperson and I'm old and they, they <laughs> yeah, they got that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly, I think we, we probably all more or less had some this kind of experience and, uh, but today we can see a great panel here and then, you know, doing great science and that's hopefully that send a really, really um, positive uh, message to our community and to really change that image, I guess, um, with that. And, and also to my own sort of uh, observation, I think, you know, girls and boys, they're all great um, when they're doing science. Um, it's just personal friends are very different, I think. Some are more, you know, good with their hands. Some are more good with, uh, you know, computers and all this. But in terms of ability to science, the same. There's no like, you know, men, boys are good with science and girls are good with us. It's just, just totally, um, you know, that's the nonsense, basically. Okay, so um, I think... Um, I think you all have a lot of, you know, experience um, doing research. What is your biggest sort of um, um, gain as you actually having this particular career? What do you think is the most important uh, things that you really think you actually benefit from doing science? Can I give a fun answer to that? <laughs> I, was able to, I was able to travel a lot uh, because I attended a lot of conferences. I met with different people. Uh, apart from the scientific side, I can say that this is the, the most fun part that I gained. Travel, <laughs> yes. Yeah, travel, seeing new places, meeting with new people. Yeah, great. Yes, I, I think travel is really one of the, you know, a really great side sort of benefits from being scientists, being able to yeah. go everywhere, of course, not uh, apart from last two years, <laughs> the pandemic. 
I think we have a lot of opportunities to to actually travel and um, to meet people from all around the world, so that we have really learned a lot of things. And for me, I think, but our, our hindsight, to be honest, um, because the travel gave me a lot of extra headache because you know when I was um, having two young kids. And they're very young, and, and then I was at a stage when I was still quite um, early into science, science, and travels being a big challenge, I think. And then I think nowadays, because of pandemics, changed the way sometimes, like we have those more more virtual opportunities. Maybe they'll help actually more in the future. The young scientists, the young you know female scientists, when they actually having kids, young kids, and that give more opportunity maybe that will encourage more participation as well. So apart from travel, uh, what else? Um, personal sort of development aspect? I think it's education. Like to me, like um, stay young, you always stay young if you're in, if you're like a, in the education field, that you always work, work with younger students. You see them to grow to some person that is better than you, more like an expert than you. I think that just feels great. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's funny, you're the one who's saying that and you're just starting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mentor a lot of graduate students. I was so happy. <laughs> I mean, that's it, why it I'm. In the industry, you grow old together with your co colleague. In universities, uh, you never grow old because your students is this constant age. Yeah. <laughs> and it's also, you know, our work is so, uh, di you know, it's, it's challenging and also you get new things. You go to new learn things every day, basically. We have to keep learning new things, which keep us also quite young because you just need to learn. Like, um, yeah, so any other points to add? Okay, if not, maybe I can ask you another question about, you know, we, we all work in science and we, we're working on really addressing, you know, difficult problem in the field. We're trying to address open questions. And so can you give, uh, talk a few examples of how you actually overcome some difficulties when you have really very hard problems solved? So when you have a, well, for instance, a very difficult technical issues or whatever, a new theory, and there's a big glitch somewhere and how you actually address them. So uh, in my case, for example, I usually first take a deep breath, sit down, don't panic. And I uh, assess the facts, facts, I check the facts. Okay, I did this and maybe I should do that. And it, I don't know, I try to create a list uh, I think the most important thing that I do is I, I try not to panic uh, in hard situations. And yeah, I try to like um, understand the facts and continue from that point. Yeah, I, I guess you just need to have a deep breath and then <laughs> and think about that. Yeah. Um, so I guess I think, may, can I pose a question to you, Yuhon, about, you know, I'm pretty sure when you being an editor, right, you interact with so many um, scientists in the world and you have to chase sometimes, you know, I, I can understand why you have a, a submitted a manuscript, you have to chase uh, some of the reviewers and all this, and some of the people might not reply on time and all this problem organizing conference. Is there some difficult situation you have met with and you actually, what's your approach to actually address those difficult situation? Uh, thank you, Professor Fu. Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, uh, for example, from the very beginning, when we want to invite the reviewers, just for one paper, maybe we need to send out uh, at least uh, 60, you, you, you know, one paper, wow. 60 reviewers all together, but not the, the uh, at once in one time, maybe uh, at the beginning, we send out for five people to review this paper and all reject it and later on another file, and then another 10, because this is a very new journal. No one know who, uh, where it is come from. So finally, 
totally we got 60 person and finally we got three agree to review this paper but this paper it is very great now we publish it in 2012 at the initial uh, launching a first paper <laughs> for the first paper we invited 60 reviewers wow. and uh, most of them rejected only three person accepted and finally we published it uh that's very frustrated but mm. now on today it's totally different <laughs> if we we send out for the reviewers maybe just two and uh, then almost uh, in 10 minutes or even in one hour res response to us. So time to time with time being, that is different. And also a lot of a uh, hard time for just like you said, like today's event, the Rosing Science, uh, the you and the Professor Hai Jiajiang and Miss Hui Wang, you can invite it from different states, different uh, uh, continents join this event. But for us, when we want to invite different people to join the like conference, for example, 2011, when we want invited 20 speakers, maybe we reach out 120 people, and then finally 20 person agree with us. That is a difficult time. But nowadays, after 10 years, it's totally different. Thank you for this. Yeah, that's really thanks for really those kind of great effort in, in you know, persistent and keep going and, uh, you know, and establish a good reputation. So that's really great to hear about that. Um, so now I'll move on to one of the, my favorite question. I'm pretty sure it's also a favorite question for many of you is I, how do you balance career and family? Because that's really probably one of the most asked question by young researchers um, in the field. So can I start probably with um, Xiuling? I know you've been balanced. Uh, I, I'm surprised I'm the only one signed up for that, <laughs> for that question. Uh, first and foremost, would you ask this question to a male colleague? I, I guess very so much. That, very rarely, right? But this is a question asked to female whether it's faculty or in any other job, it seems like we are the ones need to juggle all the time, which is probably based on reality most of the time. And so now I do accept this question. That's the title, part of the title of my talk. You have to do the balancing act um, for everybody, whether Everybody has multiple things to do at any given time. So in order to balance, you have to look at everything as a function of time, as a function of location also. You cannot be everywhere. You cannot be at your kids' parent-teacher conference and participate in your, your students' uh, um, whatever research is going on at, at the same time. Now maybe you could with Zoom. But the, the, the point I want to make is, look at with a longer horizon, you will balance. That week, you're just so frustrated, you couldn't get everything balanced, but maybe in a month, maybe even a year horizon, things will look like more or less balanced. So what balance means to me is you set your priority. If you know this is the number one thing you have to take care of now, and you take care of now and drop everything else. You cannot have everything at the same time. You have to pick what's more important to you. So there's this book was the seven habits of most efficient or effective people. So there are four quadrants. The, so separate things into important, classify them by importance and urgency. For the things that are not important, not urgent, obviously you don't do it. For things that are urgent, but important, maybe it's not that urgent if it's not important. And the thing you really want to take care of is the urgent one and important. And there are always things that are not urgent, but important. And I get the example of an NSA proposal in the US 
since they removed the deadline, they received far fewer proposals because it's not urgent anymore. There's no deadline I have to beat. So, but it's important. It's always in the back of your mind. So take those and move it to the, the list, to, to, to the top of your list. So what you value most, whether it's your personal life, your students, yourself, make sure you know your priority. The other thing about balancing is uh, compartmentalize. Some things you cannot, you, you're so frustrated with one thing that almost make you not being able to function or anything else. That is a quality you got to train yourself not to do. And it's something you, you have to put it aside, put it in one compartment and do the other thing, then come back and visit. A lot, the, the saying about time will heal is real. And whether that's a heal because you just couldn't do anything about it. But a lot of time, if you change your mindset, you actually get new ideas. I used to work for a startup company before I took the faculty job. But one of the people who reported to me, my coworkers worked together, um, said to me something I didn't realize I had. He, when he refused to work after hours, what he was telling me was because he, he couldn't just continue to think about the same thing 24 hours a day, even outside of work. He was telling me, for me, I went home, I have kids. I completely changed my mindset, then I can come back and work. So it's all, to him, it's almost like a luxury. I have kids and I can do something else, then come back and compartmentalize that and do something so your, your mind's always fresh. So take that as advantage. Instead of saying you have too many things that you have to, ju to juggle, it's all a matter of perspective and treat it as a time function. That's all I have to say. Right. Yes, it's all about perspective, right? If you think that's something you have to do is a job, but you might not actually uh, enjoy that. But if you actually take a change of a mindset, actually make you more efficient sometimes, I guess that's the, the thing. So, and also, you know, about family, you mentioned, you, you, you mentioned some things about, you know, it's, it's about how a uh, a lot of things is not urgent, but it's important. I guess family is one of the things, right? It's never, some, most of the time, it's not urgent thing, but it's the time spending quality time with the families is, is, is important. Do you have any sort of um, example or source on that? Like when you raise your kids and... Um... You will understand this joke, uh, <laughs> and then, so... I, I used to, when I was at a startup company, so my kids grew up in, in my van. I, it was startup, so you, you, you literally work <laughs> around the clock. Uh, and uh, I would make phone calls in the car. Mm. And when my daughter was like four or five, she knew how to say gas, I'll gas. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's, it's like my kids knows what is quantum dots and nanowires. They always say that. <laughs> yeah, and right. It, it's one of those things they grew up with it and you didn't know that they heard everything you said and uh, it may not be a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. So talk about balance, right? We talk about career and family and how about work and life? You know, you also touch on something about work and life balance. Anyone wants to add a, a bit on, on that? Uh, Meng Jie, especially you have so many uh, hobbies outside work, you must, you, you must know how to balance it. <laughs> Yeah, I think yeah, I think work is just part of your life. Or more often than not, I think work are as important or even less important than other part of your life. To be honest, are we are friends? We have friends. We have parents. Uh, we have partners. We have children. There's just and we have so many hobbies. I mean, you can develop a lot of hobbies and do things that you like. I mean, it is. Uh, in some sense, they're also not exclusive. They're like, don't think they're exclusive. If you're doing something else, then you couldn't uh, contribute to work. It's really not like that. I often, I mean, it's like uh, what Sholin said, changing your mind. Sometimes I go eat a really good dinner. I go watch a basketball games. I come back. I was like, wow, okay. I feel so refreshed. I don't think I really lost anything. Don't think that way. Don't think this is a negative thing or 
try to stay positive. And I, I don't think this is a waste of time. It really makes me happy. If I'm happy, I can do better work. Uh, that's how I think about it. And also, there are also ways that you can kind of make them really, uh, you can do things together. For example, I often uh, call my lab mates to watch a basketball game with me. Uh, and we, we build Lego together, so, you know, you, you can use that time to enjoy your life at the same time, you can socialize in with our, your colleagues. Uh, if you can find something that is in common that things could be mutually like beneficial, right? Uh, yeah. That's right, yeah, good, thank you. And uh, so I think my next question is about role models. I guess, you know, a lot of you already are probably being a role model for a lot of, you know, young people. But I mean, my specific questions like for yourself, who are the role model or the, you know, especially female role model to you and why that's inspire you, inspire you to, you know, um, with your research or with your life. Sandra, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, for me, the answer is very simple. My mother, because she is a physicist and she is, uh, her name is Nelly Mingolo. And she did her PhD when my sister and I were kids and she developed her own laboratory despite the strikes in the sticks in the wheel uh, due to imposed by people and building problems and well, in addition of being an excellent scientist, is an excellent teacher, and uh, as a mother, is everything what what is right. <laughs> so for me, it's very easy to answer that question because uh, she she was my mother as a mother, as a scientist, as a teacher. All all I, all I I I was the first model in my life, and for me, it wasn't uh, so strange a woman doing science <laughs> because. I look at her all my, when I was a kid. Um, in Spanish, it is vacuum bomb, not vacuum pump. She used the vacuum pump. And mm -hmm. when I tell that, those things to my my friends, they say, wow, they, she has a bomb. Because in Spanish, <laughs> say it didn't in bomb. And or, or maybe they more many uh, uh, friends thought that she was a shim professor because in Spanish also physics is very similar. So mm -hmm. yeah, I had to learn how to explain what was my mother's work. <laughs> and, uh, and, and as a mother it was wonderful. So I, I, can, I cannot say just uh, good things about her. Great, I think you're very lucky. I, I share a bit of the similar experience. My dad was a scientist and he's the earth scientist. So I'm really used to the lifestyle he runs, you know, doing lecture and working at night, doing proposals and review papers and all this. It's no stranger to me, this kind of life and which, yeah, quite naturally. So any any other sort of um, thoughts? Yes. In I, I want to add something too. Yeah, when we talk about role models, Usually people think that famous scientists, famous women scientists, but I agree with you. I, I can also admire like ordinary people if they have the courage to like change the world in a good way. For example, recently I watched a movie called Picture a Scientist. They, the woman uh, there, they were all like role model to me because they were trying to change something in the academia. So, yeah, I don't have any specific role model in my mind. The woman that I encountered throughout my life who inspired me, they are all my role models. Yeah, you, you learn different things and um, yeah, yeah, inspired by them. I think, yeah, that's, that's great um, comments on that. Um, I guess we're all doing, res a lot of us are doing research and also research related work. And, and a lot of time also we have to, you know, when we move on a bit of senior roles, we have to actually manage people, right? <laughs> so manage your time, manage people. And uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts about, uh, so what do you think is actually a good manager to, to really manage your team? What's this important aspect or things that to manage your team? You, Hong, you mentioned you have got a, a team of uh, girls <laughs> working with you and all this. I guess you are, you know, you are, you are the, the chief editor. And how do you manage your team? Uh, thank you for asking. Actually, there are many ways to be a good manager. 
uh, maybe it's very simple, just the empathy and the transposition. I think a good manager first need to have vision. Then he need to have the ability to make workable plans to um, how to turn those visions into reality. But most importantly, a good manager should know how to carry out those, pl those plans, how to inspire and lead everyone in the team to work toward the vision in order to truly achieve the goal. Uh, this is my simple way. Thank you. Thanks, Yu Hong, indeed. Uh, any other thoughts? I think, Xiaoling, you, you are managing big team, as assume. Your research team is probably quite big. <laughs> How do you manage it? Oh, I, I, I don't manage them. <laughs> um, <laughs> Maybe yeah. don't use manage, but you, you're a leader, right? Group leader. Uh, right? They, they, they manage the team? They're all self-managed. Uh, I, I don't know. I think it depends. Managing students is different from managing staff and mm -hmm. it depends on the type of staff uh, also. Um, I, I think one essential concept to be a team leader is to maximize everybody's poten potential to the best you can because everybody's different. If you treat all students the same way, they may not be the type everybody else is. So they have a different working style. They, they tend to work in the evening or in the morning. I let them be. So they, they, um, but at the end of the day is you, you have to deliver and this is the metric you are measured against. Um, so so I, I, I try not to micromanage. Very, very good comments. I think that's um, indeed very important. Um, I think my next question, uh, or I think is, a, is something I would like to actually have a bit of a discussion on is um, this year's theme um, for International Women's Day. Women's Day is break the bias. We early on in the discussion, we touch on a little bit of bias that actually women actually, uh, scientists in particular, um, would probably experience in you know, various occasions. So I would like to hear really the panel's thoughts on um, how we can really break the bias, different types of bias in, in our life and um, especially facing um, women. So how we can in the science field to break this bias? Yeah, um, I believe first of all, women should be more visible. So you are doing this great event, so which is a big step. Uh, I hear some of my male colleagues that if, a, if in a conference the panel is only male panelists, sometimes they decline to go, which is another good step. I think if women are more visible in the field so that uh, like the younger generation will see that, oh, actually there are women in science or in engineering. So I think one of the important things that we should do is uh, to make women more visible in the field. Very, very good point. I, I, I kind of agree, agree more again is because I think um, for the conferences and all this, you know, we just need to encourage the participation as well as involvement as different level, all levels of, uh, you know, participation of women. I think that's, that's really important point. With the persons, right, as we early on discussed, you know, they, you will have much less biased decision made you have much less um, intimidating uh, environment for young people to get in. And, um, and also we should also, you know, with that image um, and the visibility and a young generation will see the role that we play in the scientific field. And that will really also encourage, you know, for, for them to actually study, uh, study science and technology and have a career in that. So um, I think my, uh, next question is actually a very light one, <laughs> uh, I think, because I've seen you guys have uh, all show this different uh, hobbies, and I just want to see, listen to a little bit more about you guys talking about uh, your uh, your hobbies. Uh, you Hong, you you have a nice ballet finishing of the <laughs> of your video. Uh, maybe I start with you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, my hobby is ballet. I'm taking this uh, regular lessons 
Many people find it surprising that I'm learning this difficult dance style at my age. You know, I'm nearly 60 years old. So it is true that it's hard to be a good ballet dancer at my age. But I enjoy challenges and I enjoy the gracefulness of the dance. And I love very much watching the instructor of dancer to beautiful music. Thank you. Oh, that's that's great. The reason I'm asking you is because, um, you know, surprise, surprise, I've danced ballet for five years. I've done the adult ballet and learning all these um, difficult moves and trying to refine each time is, is great fun, I, I think, and keep you really, um, you know, energetic as well. So any other sharing of the hobbies? Uh, Mengjie, you've got out of so many different hobbies, which one is your favorite? <laughs> See, my hobbies are much less serious <laughs> than many others. <laughs> For me, like I recently, I have been really like into really into building Legos. I mean, wow. If the previous question asked what profession you want to be if you're not a professor, I think I want to be like a Lego like designer. Then I can get so many free sets. I don't need to spend so much <laughs> in buying this. And uh, you know, I got to build my own. Are uh, like watching NBA games. I don't know whether that counts one. I do I do post the city that I live in uh, to have uh, like NBA teams there. <laughs> it's one <laughs> last thing I looked into that I can now like 10 minutes driving, I can watch uh, like, I can watch two NBA games, uh, two NBA teams games. So it's just mm. great. That's it's not really nice. a hobby. Yeah, but it's something that I would love to do. <laughs> yeah, that, that's nice. Yeah. Sandra, do you have any hobby um, apart from mathematics? <laughs> well, I, I swim. Now I'm not swimming too much, but um, I, I used to, to do competitions on open waters, um, the rivers and mm-hmm. lakes. Uh, I, I love it. Not <laughs> soccer. <laughs> no. No. It's not common. Well, this is a, a, a some a problem in Argentina. They, it's not common women uh, playing soccer now. Mm. Is is no now is is um, making a fashion. But when I was a kid, was well, women yeah. play volley, women play yeah hockey, hockey the other one not okay, hockey, the one, yeah. not the, the, the normal. I don't know how to say it, hockey, okay, and okay. Uh, um, another sport. But uh, I will never play football. Yeah. It's a man game in Argentina. <laughs> yes. Yes. But I know that in the US is more common for women. Yeah. yeah, I think it's also quite popular in Australia, even yeah, for, for girls to play soccer and foot, not football. Yes, maybe. But yeah, I yeah. say football because for us it's football, but it's soccer. I know. Yeah. <laughs> for us it's soccer. We don't know. Uh, we don't see the other football. I know. <laughs> Almost with yeah. their feet. <laughs> Yeah, we we'll <laughs> and football and also their soccer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Shinsu, and you, 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 of course, co- cooking is one of your hobby. <laughs> yeah, on bakery, do you also cook? Um, like really, um, uh, I would like to first add a thing about the soccer. We also call it football in Turkey, and we don't uh, call it soccer, and we, we don't know <laughs> the uh, like the football that people uh, play here. Uh, and similarly, Turkish people, they are very interested in uh, soccer, let's say. And unfortunately, uh, the women are not involved in soccer at all. So talking mm. about cooking, uh, as I mentioned, I improved uh, this skill during the pandemic. Before <laughs> that, my hobbies were uh, similar to Mengji. I, I also like to play with Legos. I have a kit of women of NASA uh, uh, here in the box right now. Me too. I bought two sets of them in case they <laughs> increase value in the future. <laughs> it's in the library right now. And I'm also a Star Wars fan. So I have a Darth Vader, a TIE Fighter, Lego sets. So I also enjoy playing with Legos. So cooking, uh, since I had a lot of free time, because uh, everything was online, I didn't have to go to school, just online working. Um, I improved my cooking skills because I was always fascinated by all kinds of different spices. So I bought like different spices. I bought a book. I tried to like mix uh, the spices to see what will happen. So this cookie uh, that you showed in the video, uh, it has a mahlep. 
which is a spice very commonly used in the Turkey, Greece, and Armenia region or Middle Eastern region. They also put this kind of spice in their cookies. It has a very specific smell and it is made from a, a it is a grounded cherry seed special mm -hmm. type of cherry okay. so yeah i started to learn the stories about these different spices how they taste smell and yeah and it really like uh, relaxes me when i do cooking i do a little bit of presentation then of course i eat them very fast <laughs> why not of course <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, Shuling, obviously yoga is one of your hobby, right? How much time do you really spend on that to develop that skills? I'm, I'm really bad. <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> Resolution involves more yoga. <laughs> I never keep up. Uh, I keep it up until Chinese New Year, then I make another res <laughs> resolution. <laughs> Same here. Um, I, I, I think... Uh, to uh, most scientists are kind of boring. <laughs> we don't have that much uh, hobby. We take it to the level, then you can be a professional. So when I was in college, P Peking University, I was part of the orchestra. Oh, wow. Uh, and I, I play yang qin. And mm. all the other people in the orchestra were the ones who didn't get in uh, Beijing Yin Yuan Xue Yuan. Yeah. The so professional music <laughs> college, and they ended up in Beijing University. And, uh, um, and I, I went there, it's like, oh my God, these people are all professional. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't do it, but I survived. I, I, I uh, played with them. So that, that I, I think uh, the, most people have many things they can develop a hobby if you have the time to me yoga is just so convenient you don't even have to go to classes just do it at home that's why i picked that yeah. pick up that one um and yeah i i also like photography uh, photography and if i have all the time but anyway so mm -hmm. I, I think it's just fun if just uh, yeah. do something else yeah definitely relax you know it's a good good great like yoga is like meditation and then relax put your minds away from you know things and I think that's, I also enjoy doing that too. So it's great. I think, oh, time's really running fast. I think I have just the last question to wind down this discussion. It's the question to all the panel members. Um, it's about, uh, do you have any suggestions or advice for young women students and science workers? May I start with you? Yes, Sandra, please. Well, uh, first I will say don't give up. Uh, many times people make us think that we don't, uh, we are not good for science and sometimes we believe it. And so that's why I say I, I don't give up. Um, I have to mention in Argentina, to, well, now is today, now is today, it's eight. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> of, it also is a day of struggle because there continue to be a lot of discrimination and mistreatment to women here and all over the world, I think. <laughs> And I think the only way to reverse this is to be all the women you needed and to and to say when you see the, I mean just this don't 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 silence. <laughs> That's not the main um, suggestion for me. Great, thank you. Meng Jie. Yeah, I think our advice to give is to look for role models or do talk to do or to talk to them. Uh, like talk to your peers or, you know, really unite a network or the female scientists that together uh, form a network and trying to support each other. Uh, it will be really beneficial, maybe not for now, but it will be have a long-term benefit uh, if like everybody can stay together, I think, form a community. Yeah, yeah great. Thank you, Moonjie. And um, um, you home, please. Uh, thank you. As you know, I'm a chief editor of an academic journal. My advice is, if you are going to publish your work, please keep in mind, come to Life Science and Applications and their sister journals. I'm not joking. 
this is really a great journal. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Thank you. I'm pretty sure we, a lot of audience will be really, really you know, looking forward to uh, get their paper published in your journal. And the Xingnu, in Shusu, sorry. Yeah, it's okay. So I uh, actually agree with Sandra and Mengji's uh, comments. So I'm also from a, I'm from a developing country, Turkey. So women there, they have like a more serious struggles compared to struggles of women in science. I can like advise like all the women in general, like don't give up as Sandra said. As Mengji said, communication is really important. So to students, I can advise uh, that if you are in a conference, for example, I was at first very shy. I thought that my English was really bad. They will make fun of me. And I just spent uh, my time in a corner alone. So then I realized that uh, if you don't talk with anybody, you cannot make any connections. So it is really important. You have to uh, be able to like explain yourself to other people. And it's your English actually improves with practice. It's another advantage of talking. So don't be shy, don't give up, uh, communicate, be visible. These are my advices. Thank you. Uh, Xiu Ling. Sorry, Xiu Ling, you were muted. All right, yeah. okay, I'm not, yeah, sorry, sorry about that. Uh, uh, so I heard a lot of those advice be persistent and, and uh, all of that, but you have to get in the door. You have to not be afraid to do something. You've been always thinking of, you're just afraid to fail. The reason you don't do something is because you are scared. You're afraid people will judge you if you fail. So embrace the opportunity, do it for yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you. With that note, I think it's time we have to winding up our discussion. Uh, thank you very much, all our panel members, and also for your, your, your time and your you know, commitment as well, your great presentation early on. And uh, to, to finally, I would just like to take this opportunity to really wish that all the women around the world have a great International Day of Women. And also I would hope that with everyone's efforts, sometimes in the future, actually, the real gender equality can be achieved well and truly. So there's no need to, for us to have this special day anymore. So with that, thank you very much, everyone, and um, hope to meet you sometimes in the future. And that's um, the end of our first session. Thank you. <laughs>